The remnants might not have leaders, but their human hosts do. Once we get the leaders chasing us, the others will fall in behind. And the fact is, sooner or later, Erskine or Shudder are going to figure out where we are. They will be coming for us. Happy, happy, Tanith said. Joy, joy. We're going to need some way to physically connect the possessed, Fletcher said. I can do that, said Valkyrie. Everyone looked at her, and she reached out to the shadows in the room, and they rose up like mist around them. It's one of the training exercises in necromancy, she said. When they're this spread out, the shadows can't hurt anyone, but it'd still work as a bond. All Fletcher would have to do is teleport me, and everyone these shadows are touching would come with us. That's fine here in this room, China said. But would you be able to connect all those remnants? Valkyrie hesitated only a moment. Yes, she said. I would. Excellent, said Skullduggery. Ghastly, you'd better set off as soon as Fletcher's teleported Valkyrie and Tanith. It should take four or five hours in this weather to get to Kerry, even with the Bentley's tires. Ghastly blinked. You're letting me take the Bentley? It's faster than your van. Just. Take good care of her, okay? I will. Skullduggery went silent. When he spoke again, it was with great reluctance. Not one scratch. Okay. Not one bespoke. You concentrate on getting the keys. Let me worry about your car. I'm multi-talented. I can do both. Okay. That's everything. Unless anyone has any other questions, let's get to it. Fletcher took the Echo Stone from Valkyrie. Don't get into any trouble while I'm gone, he said to her. I know you're not going to be able to resist the temptation, but you have to remember that I won't be able to rescue you. Valkyrie smirked. I think I can manage without you for a few hours. He nodded and leaned in, and they kissed. Please stay safe, he whispered. His kisses were much nicer than Kaylin's, softer, sweeter, warmer. She banished thoughts of Kaylin from her mind and kissed her boyfriend again. I will, she whispered back. They looked around when Ghastly cleared his throat and watched him touch the tattoos on his collarbones. Clear skin flowed over his scars and he walked awkwardly up to Tanith. Um, he said to her, don't die. Okay, Tanith said. When this is over, he continued, I'm going to make you dinner. You don't have to like it, and you don't have to eat it, and I suppose you don't even have to be there, but, but that's what I'm going to do. Tanith frowned. Are you asking me on a date? I think so, yes. Will you have dinner with me? Tanith smiled the most beautiful smile. I'd love to, she said. She laid a hand on his chest, tapped her fingers on his collarbones, and the clear skin retracted. Once his scars were revealed, Tanith kissed him once on the lips. I like steak, she said. Can't go wrong with steak. Steak it is, he murmured. He stepped away, and Valkyrie grinned at Tanith. Oh, good God, China said, rolling her eyes. I do hope the remnants kill me first. Chapter 41 The Head in the Box Drogheda Town Centre was lit up against the dark, but there was no one around to appreciate the Christmas lights. It was far too cold for people to be walking the streets, and the roads were far too icy for driving. Fletcher left Valkyrie and Tanith on the main street, giving Valkyrie a quick kiss, and offered another to Tanith. Valkyrie punched his shoulder, and he vanished with a pained expression on his face. My eyeballs are cold, Tanith said. That's not a good sign. They walked quickly, in an effort to warm themselves up. They're saying this is the coldest winter in sixty years, Valkyrie muttered. I need a woolly hat and mittens. Mittens, Tanith echoed wistfully. 
may be tied to my sleeves. I need earmuffs, too, Valkyrie decided. Fluffy ones. My ears are red, aren't they? Tanith took a glance. Yep, but not as red as your nose. I'm going to ask Ghastly to make me clothes like yours. Then only my hands and face will get frostbite. Have you thought, maybe, that the reason you're freezing your bits off is because you don't wear enough clothes? How about wearing something under that waistcoat? Tanith pulled her coat tighter around her. My waistcoat is not designed to have anything under it but me, Valkyrie. And you wonder why you're cold? They reached the church. As daunting as it was impressive, its spires stretched into the night sky like spear tips. The doors were locked, but clicked open at Tanith's touch. With the main lights off, the inside of the church was creepy. They passed a tomb that had a carving of skeletons wearing shrouds. To the left of the massive altar was a shrine, the centerpiece of which was a pedestal that held a glass case ensconced in gold and surrounded by long candles. It was topped off with a brass spire that reached upwards for three meters. Resting inside the case was a mummified head, leathery and brown with empty eye sockets and tiny yellow teeth. Tanith peered at it. Who's this guy? she asked. Oliver Plunkett, Valkyrie told her. In 1600 and something, he was hanged, drawn and quartered for practising Catholicism in Ireland. By the English, of course. Of course, Tanith responded solemnly. And we're all very sorry about that. Valkyrie nodded. As well you should be. And why is his head on display in a church? asked Tanith. Where else would you display a head? Doesn't it seem kind of gruesome to you? I mean, we're used to seeing stuff like this, but what about ordinary people just coming here to pray, kneeling and muttering and crossing themselves? And they look over and see someone's head in a glass box. Well, that's pretty morbid, not to mention kind of weird. Excuse me? said a voice from behind. They turned. A priest stood there, paunchy and middle-aged. I'm Father Reynolds, he continued. Can I help you with anything? Valkyrie held her hands down by her sides, ready to push at the air should she notice even one black vein. We're just passing through, Mr. Reynolds, she assured him. He stiffened slightly. That's Father Reynolds, he said. Oh, I'm sorry, Valkyrie said. And what's your first name? My full name is Father Declan Reynolds, and you, young lady, have broken into this church. Pleased to meet you, Declan, Valkyrie responded, ignoring the accusation. I'm Valkyrie. This is Tanith. You might be able to help us, actually. We're looking for something. It's a flat piece of gold, about the length of your hand. Would you have seen it? The priest frowned at her. You lost some gold. We didn't lose it, Tanith said. We're just looking for it. A friend of ours told us it'd be somewhere near the head in the box. We're assuming that he meant this head in the box, unless you have another one stashed away somewhere. I may be new to the parish, but as far as I am aware, this is the only head in a box that we have. I'm sorry. If this is a joke, I fail to see how it is funny. The flat piece of gold, Valkyrie said. Have you seen it? I don't know what you're talking about, the priest said, turning to walk away. But maybe you can explain yourselves to the guards when they get here. If he expected them to protest or to run after him, he was disappointed. When he'd walked a few steps and they still hadn't reacted, he whirled to find them examining the box. Come away from there at once! Valkyrie ran her hands along the base. In a second, she said. You are not allowed to touch the cabinet, the priest shouted, storming towards them. Valkyrie's fist caught him just under the chin. He stumbled back, his legs wobbling and his eyes already closing. He slumped to the ground and lay there, unconscious. Oh, Valkyrie said, I thought he was possessed. Sure you did, Tanith grinned. She pressed her hand against the golden base of the cabinet, and they heard a soft click. She pushed, rotated her fingertips, 
and a flat piece of gold came away, dropping from the base into her palm. Damn, she said, I'm good. They called Skullduggery to let him know they'd found the first half of the key. He told them to walk to the bus depot and wait for him there. Up through Drogheda, the streets were frozen and empty. The roads glistened like someone had carelessly tossed down a hundred thousand tiny crystals. Part cars were covered in frost, windshields were thick with ice. Christmas lights gave it all an unearthly sheen, and somewhere far away a house alarm was going off. Valkyrie and Tanith crossed the road and kept heading south, towards the bus depot. Valkyrie had her arms crossed, hands jammed under her armpits. Her ears were freezing and her nose was red and running. She stepped on an icy patch and her feet flew out from under her. For the third time in ten minutes, she landed on her backside. Tanith looked back and sighed. Even she had stopped finding that funny. They crossed the bridge, staying off the pavements, sticking to the road where it was less slippery. They hadn't heard one single moving car, let alone seen one. The lights at the depot were on, and the buses sat still and silent. They hopped the low wall, and Tanith pushed open the glass door. An old woman looked up from where she was sitting. Valkyrie nodded to her warily, while Tanith went to the ticket booth. It was almost as cold in there as it was outside. Uh, there's nobody else here, the old woman said. I tried the office as well. Nobody here at all. Tanith glanced at Valkyrie and went to make sure. When she was gone, the old woman looked back to Valkyrie. Have you been watching the news? Terrible, isn't it? All those sick people. It is, said Valkyrie. I've been sitting here for hours. I tried calling my son, but I couldn't get through. The phones are down. Uh, is that what it is? I hope he's all right. I hope he hasn't got sick. He's got children, you know. A ten-year-old and a four-year-old. Ah, oh, he's probably fine, said Valkyrie. The old woman did her best to smile. I just want to get home. It isn't right. This town is never this quiet. Where are all the people? Are they all sick? The man on the news said that the sick people are prone to outbreaks of violence. If everyone is sick, it's not safe here. I just want to go home. Us too. What's your name, child? The old woman didn't look like someone a remnant would hijack. She was neither young nor strong. She was small and her hair was white. And even though she was wrapped up against the cold, she looked thin and frail. My name's Valkyrie. Oh, that's an unusual name. French, is it? Uh, Scandinavian, I think. It's very pretty. Tanith came back. No one here, she said. I told you, the old woman responded. I've been here for three hours, and you two are the first people I've seen. I should just be thankful that you're not like the ones they showed on the news. Where do you live? Valkyrie asked. Dulik, the old woman answered. Do you know it? I've seen signs for it. The Dulik bus was supposed to leave at ten past seven, but nothing out there has even moved. I haven't seen any drivers. I don't know how I'm going to get home. We're expecting a lift any minute now, Valkyrie said. Maybe we could give you a Val, Tanith interrupted, glaring at her. Ah, you're very kind, the old woman smiled. But it's quite all right. We can't leave her here, Valkyrie said to Tanith. Why not? Tanith answered. Who's going to touch her? She's safer here than she would be with us. It's freezing in here. So? She has mittens? Tanith turned to the old woman. Normally I'd have no problem inviting you along, but for all we know, you might be sick. Me? The old woman said, surprised. But I'm not running around hurting people. No, you're not, but you could be about to start. The old woman blinked at them, then seemed to shrink back into the layers of clothes she was wearing. 
I should probably stay here anyway. My son might be looking for me. Tanith shrugged at Valkyrie. See? Problem solved. Then the lights went out. Great, she heard Tanith mutter. For a few seconds, they were in nothing but blackness. Then Valkyrie's eyes started to adjust, and she could see vague outlines in the gloom. The shape that was Tanith moved to a window. The whole town's gone dark, she said. There's not a light on for miles. Oh, maybe they have a torch in the office, said the old woman, sounding scared. I have a lighter, Valkyrie said, clicking her fingers. She cupped the flame, disguising the fact that it burned in her palm. Oh, that's bright, the old woman said, relieved. I don't mean to be a burden on you, but is it at all possible to get a lift with you when your friend comes? I don't really like the idea of staying here alone. I'm sure we can work something out, Valkyrie said. She could see Tanith in the flickering light. Her friend did not look pleased. I'll look for a torch. Valkyrie moved into the office, searched the two desks and then the shelves. She found a torch and clicked it on. The beam lit up the entire room. Found one, she called. She heard Tanith gag, and fear shot through her. She ran out of the office. The old woman had her thin, frail hands wrapped around Tanith's throat. Valkyrie gave a roar, and the old woman cursed in a language Valkyrie had never heard before. Valkyrie was almost on top of her when the old woman's thin, spindly fist flashed out, almost taking her head off. The torch went spinning across the floor, and Valkyrie went down, rolled by pure instinct, got up, and didn't know what was happening. Her legs buckled slightly, and she staggered, saw the old woman hurling punches down on Tanith. Valkyrie's palms snapped against the air, and the space rippled as the old woman shot sideways, whooping as she went. Tanith sprawled across the floor, unconscious. The old woman scrambled up. By the light of the torch, Valkyrie saw her black lips and vein-ridden face. You can't escape, the old woman said. And why would you want to? You have a glorious destiny. It's not destiny, Valkyrie seethed, stepping closer. Even if it was, I've changed it. It's not happening. That's why we're here, the woman explained. To make sure it does. Darkest, we were aimless. We were nothing. We were anger and hatred and spite. But now, now we have purpose. Now we have a future with you. If you want me to lead you, then let's start right now. I have a pair of shackles in my pocket. I want you to put them on. The old woman smiled and shook her head. You need to be guided further along the path, she said. Then you will assume your mantle. Then we'll obey. Right now you still think you're Valkyrie Kane. You still think you have friends, like this one. The old woman knelt by Tanith and stroked her hair. Let me be your friend. I leave this body, this old decrepit thing and I'll join with her. Such a nice form to take, with that pretty face, with everything so hard and strong and firm. All this muscle and all this leather. Stop describing her, Valkyrie said. It's getting weird. The old woman lunged, but Tanith raised her arm and tripped her, and the lunge turned into a stumble. Valkyrie slid into her, flipped her to the floor, got behind her, and choked. The old woman squirmed like a fish, but Valkyrie held on. She didn't want to hurt her, didn't want to cause the old woman actual harm. She just needed her to go to sleep for a while. She tightened the choke, and the old woman weakened, and then her head drooped forward. Valkyrie turned her on her side and got up. Oh, my God, Valkyrie said numbly. We just beat up a pensioner. Evil pensioner, Tanith corrected, coughing slightly as she dragged herself to her feet. What was she babbling about? I heard her say darkest. Yeah, yeah, she did. Just, you know, more babbling. Couldn't make sense of half of it. Y you okay? I'm good. Uh, a bit woozy, 
She has a pretty good right hook, you know, for a granny. Chapter 42 The Lesson Begins Teleporting 1,000 people is not that different from teleporting one person, Gordon said as they sped down the empty motorway. The effort, the magic, goes into the initial opening of the rift in space. How wide that rift eventually opens is somewhat immaterial. What rift? Fletcher asked. Do you actually know how your power works? Fletcher couldn't look at Gordon while they were in motion, so he kept his eyes fixed on the windscreen. Sure, I think about a place I've been, and I go there. I don't open a rift in space or anything. Actually, that's precisely what you're doing. Emmett Peregrine told me how he got his head around it, and I think it might help you. Uh, Fletcher, I don't want to sound like a schoolteacher or anything, but could you look at me while I'm talking to you? Sorry, Fletcher said. I can't. You make me carsick. Ghastly frowned. How does Gordon make you carsick? Well, he keeps slipping, you know, out of the car, kind of. That's hardly my fault, said Gordon. Sometimes I don't notice a turn coming up, or Ghastly switches lanes without telling me. Sorry about that, said Ghastly. It's quite all right. Fletcher, I promise I'll try harder. Fletcher exhaled, then nodded, and turned around in his seat. Okay, he said. Carry on. Gordon smiled gratefully. Then the Bentley went over a bump, and his face disappeared into the back seat. He had to lean forward to be visible again. The whole thing made Fletcher quite queasy. Instead of focusing on the distance travelled, Gordon said, think of it like this. You're not the one moving. I'm not. You're using your power to stay totally still, and the world moves around you until you are exactly where you want to be. Uh, it's like me right now. I'm tethered to the Echo Stone, and the Echo Stone is moving, but I'm not. The world is moving around me, and occasionally through me. For you, Fletcher, existence itself rotates and pivots according to your will. I'm sure someone of your self-esteem has no problem with the notion that the universe revolves around him. Am I correct? I think that all the time. Gordon smiled. I know the feeling well. Emmett used to say that he let the world do the travelling while he stayed in the same place. He focused on where he wanted the world to stop, and that's all he did. He didn't burden himself with thoughts of distance, or how many people he was taking with him, or how big a cargo he was transporting. He saw his destination as a clear point in a whirlwind, and he let it come to him. Do you understand? I... I think so. That's good. Understanding is the first step. Acceptance, the second. Once you've accepted this as a fact, the possibilities are endless. Chapter 43 By the Sword Burgundy Dalrymple didn't live in a very nice house. It was, in China's opinion, ramshackle to the point of dilapidation. It stood alone, a bungalow on a dead road. Two windows were lit up, and even the light was sickly. The garden was a jungle of weeds and long grasses. To be fair, China couldn't see much of it in the darkness, and for that she was grateful. Squalor held no appeal. Valkyrie called just as Skullduggery turned off the van's engine. China waited while he spoke to her. They'd obviously succeeded in securing their half of the key. Skullduggery told Valkyrie to wait for them, and then he activated his façade and nodded to China. They got out and approached the house. The front door opened slightly. Go away, said a man's voice from behind it. Skullduggery and China stopped, and Skullduggery's fake face smiled. Hello, Burgundy, he said. That's not me, said the man. That's somebody else. Go away. Burgundy, Skullduggery said. We just want to talk to you. One minute of your time and we'll be gone. I'm not Burgundy. You're Burgundy Dalrymple. China said. 
master swordsman and war hero. The man's laugh came out as something like a bark. <laughs> war hero? No one calls me a war hero. Well, China said, stepping out of the shadows so that he could see her face. I suppose it all depends on which side of the war you were fighting on. There was a moment of silence. Then his voice cracked as he said, You're China's sorrows. I am, and this is Skullduggery Pleasant. We'd like to talk to you about remnants, if you have the time. I... I suppose... May we come in? Skullduggery asked. Well, all right. But I don't allow people to bring in weapons. Are you armed? No. Show me. Open you a jacket. Skullduggery hesitated. Oh, he said. Armed. Yes, I am armed. I'm a little armed. I just have a gun. In some people's hands, that's barely a weapon. Take it out and leave it there. Crumbling, Skullduggery did as he was told. OK, said the voice. Come in. They stepped onto the porch. The wood was old and rotten and creaked under their weight. Skullduggery pushed the front door open. The hall which greeted them did so with dim light. The moment he stepped through, his face rippled and withdrew from his skull. He stopped immediately and turned to her. Be careful, he said in his soft voice. This house has been bound. China felt it too upon crossing the threshold. The invisible tattoos that graced her body went dull as her magic was dampened. I'm here, the man called. They walked slowly into the living room. It was surprisingly big, but barely furnished. There was a dining table in the middle of the room, and a few chairs around it. A few lamps, that was it. The walls, however, were decorated with all manner of fencing swords, rapiers, and sabres. And unlike their dusty surroundings, these swords looked like they were lovingly kept in perfect working order. Burgundy Dalrymple stood on the far side of the dining table. He was a little too skinny, and he needed a shave and a haircut, and China imagined a wash. I'm Burgundy Dalrymple, he said nervously. We need your help, Skullduggery told him. We know of your history with the remnants, and we know how much it has affected you and how you live your life. Okay, Dalrymple said. Go on. We also know that you have tracked down one half of the receptacle key. I'd have tracked them both down by now, Dalrymple nodded. But people stopped talking to me about ten or fifteen years ago, so no one would answer my, you know, my questions. Why? What do you want? We want your half of the key, China said. Dalrymple's tone was firm. No, no, I'm keeping it so that no one will be able to trap the remnants ever again. I would have destroyed it already if I'd been able to, but it's pretty durable. Why do you want it? Skullduggery tilted his head. You mean you don't know? If I knew, would I be asking? We need it to turn the machine on Burgundy. The remnants are loose. Dalrymple looked at Skullduggery, and for a long moment he said nothing. Where? he said at last, sounding like he needed a drink of water. Where are they? We need the key, Burgundy. I thought you wanted to study it or something. To run tests, to find out how something like that, how it works, but... But you want to use the receptacle? Why would I help you to do that? This is what I've been waiting for. I don't want to threaten you in your own home, Skullduggery said. So, if you'd like to step outside, I can threaten you there. Outside? Dalrymple sneered. Where magic isn't bound? Where you can throw fire at me and take the key from around my charred neck? Ah, so you have it on you. Dalrymple went to the wall and grabbed a sword. You want it? You are welcome to take it. It would really be much easier if you just gave it to me. Come on, Dalrymple snarled. Let's be having you. I'd really rather not, Skullduggery said. 
If you can beat me, you can take the key from my blood-soaked corpse. Again, not entirely appealing. Take up your steel. Skullduggery sighed, walked to the closest wall, and chose a sword with a jewel-encrusted hilt. Dalrymple walked forward and suddenly lunged. The blades clashed, and Dalrymple began circling. We really don't have to do this, Skullduggery said. I mean you no harm, none at all. I mean you acres of harm, Dalrymple growled. Untold quantities of harm. I will visit a whole continent of harm upon you before we are through. You are an odd fellow. China watched Dalrymple come in with three quick jabs. Skullduggery parried the first two and sidestepped the third, responding with a riposte that Dalrymple blocked easily. They went at it again, blades flashing and singing together. Dalrymple kept his left hand held high behind him in a classical fencer's stance. Skullduggery kept his free hand low and out in front, far less flashy, far more cautious. Oh, you're good, Dalrymple said. You're too kind, Skullduggery responded. I haven't faced anyone half as good as you in a hundred years. That's very nice of you to say so. Not really. I just haven't fought anyone in a hundred years. Dalrymple pressed forward his attack, and Skullduggery retreated, barely keeping the slashing blade at bay. I'm rusty, Dalrymple continued. Out to practice. My form is all wrong. It looks fine to me. Oh, it's sloppy. Dalrymple batted Skullduggery's blade down and swiped at his head. Skullduggery jerked away and stumbled. In my prime? That would have taken you a head off. Skullduggery scrambled to his feet. How embarrassing for you. There was a time in my life when swordplay was the only thing that meant anything. Everyone needs a hobby. But it was an empty time, Dalrymple said, almost sobbed. A lonely time. Skullduggery moved in, trying to take advantage of the distraction, but couldn't get through Dalrymple's defence. And then the remnant came into me, and that loneliness went away. Dalrymple slashed, cutting through the sleeve of Skullduggery's jacket. Skullduggery backed off. But you can't remember any of it, he said. I don't need to remember details. It was the feeling. The feeling of being whole, being complete. That's what I remember. That's what I miss. That's what I want back. And have you ever tried just making friends? Dalrymple snarled again and stepped in quickly, his blade seeking out Skullduggery, who was doing his best to remain elusive. You mock me. I don't, Skullduggery insisted, on the retreat once more. You laugh at me. I find it rude to laugh at a man with a sword. The blades scraped together, and Dalrymple flicked his wrist. Skullduggery's sword flew from his grip, and he had to dive to the floor to escape. He rolled and came up, giving himself some room. Burgundy, China said, taking a rapier from the wall. Would you mind awfully if I replaced Skullduggery for the remainder of this duel? Dalrymple looked around, his eyes narrowed. I'm not going to spare you just because I've fallen in love with you, he warned. I know about you. I know it's not real love. But of course it's real, she said, flourishing the rapier. All love is real love. She sent out a light jab that he batted away. Otherwise, it's not love, is it? Otherwise, it's pointless, a waste of time and energy. And I despise wasting either. Now it was Skullduggery's turn to watch as Dalrymple came back at China, and she blocked, replied with a swipe that he blocked, the shrill taps of blade on blade settling into a rhythm as they moved around each other. You are trying to confuse me, Dalrymple said. I'm trying no such thing. The love you're feeling is a real and genuine thing. Just because it is not reciprocated in the slightest does not lessen its worth. You don't love me. Dalrymple sneered. Isn't that what I just said? He neared. You wouldn't be fighting if you knew what it was like when your body is a vassal for a remnant. You don't need tricks to make people fall in love with you. 
You don't need their love. China backed away, blocking and countering. She stepped up onto a chair, and then she was on the table, and he was following her up, the clashing of their swords only getting faster. It was dangerous up there, not much room to manoeuvre, and Dalrymple's strikes were increasing in strength. China was impressed. Her wrist was already aching. She saw Skullduggery out of the corner of her eye, retrieve his sword, and walk towards them. Burgundy, he said. I am a firm believer in fair fights. I really am. But we did not come here to lose. We came here to get the half of the key that you stole, and we won't be leaving without it. So, I'm afraid we must cheat a little. While Dalrymple parried China's thrust, Skullduggery poked at his leg, and Dalrymple's blade clanged off his. China blinked, then defended, and Skullduggery tried again to injure Dalrymple. But once again, Dalrymple's sword flashed down, faster than her eye could follow, and he batted Skullduggery's attempt away, and then resumed his attack on China. She would have thought it impossible if she had not been there to personally witness it. Cheating against you isn't easy, Skullduggery murmured. Dalrymple jumped down from the far side of the table. China followed him to the floor, while Skullduggery moved around. They closed in, their swords cutting towards Dalrymple, while he defended with startling alacrity. China went left, and Skullduggery went right, and still they failed to draw blood. The entire affair was becoming completely unacceptable. Any moment now, China was about to perspire. She leaned in with a deep thrust that was parried, but she responded with a flick that almost took Dalrymple's hand off at the wrist. Now the master swordsman was on the back foot. Skullduggery went low, and China went high, and then they switched and switched again, robbing Dalrymple of a chance to anticipate their next move. Surrender, Skullduggery said. Dalrymple didn't answer immediately, too busy defending. You seem to have me beaten, he said at last. So it seems. But if this is true, then why are you smiling? Because, Dalrymple answered, I know something you don't know. And what is that? asked Skullduggery. I'm not right-handed, Dalrymple replied, and threw the sword into his left hand. China cursed and fell back under his renewed onslaught, and Skullduggery cried out as a sliver of bone was cut from his arm. China lashed out desperately to keep Dalrymple away, but his sword was moving much faster than her own, and she couldn't find her balance. She fell to one hand, continuing the fight with her other, while she tried to scuttle out of range. Skullduggery reared up behind Dalrymple, and Dalrymple spun, thrusting through Skullduggery's ribcage. Skullduggery froze, looking down at the blade that pierced his clothing. Then Dalrymple twisted the sword and dragged it out, so that it scraped across Skullduggery's sternum, and Skullduggery howled in pain and crumpled to the ground. China slashed her rapier at the back of Dalrymple's neck, but he dodged, whirled, and his sword crashed against hers, and suddenly her hand was empty. He kicked her in the chest, and she went down. He stood over her, with the tip of his blade at her throat. There, he said, panting a little. You are defeated. Now it is you who will answer my questions. Where are they? Where are the remnants? I don't know she said. The tip pressed against her skin. Tell me, or I'll kill you. Skullduggery was still curled up on the floor, his arms wrapped around himself. China sighed. Ah, fine, I'll tell you. But if you switched on a television or a radio, you'd already know all this. I don't trust modern technology, he informed her. Why doesn't that surprise me? In that case, you've missed the countless stories of riots that are breaking out all across the city, all across the country. Dalrymple's mouth hung open. They're all out? The remnants? All of them? That's... That's... That's what you've been waiting for. His eyes brimmed with tears. Yes. For well over a hundred years... He nodded quickly. Yes. 
then tonight is your lucky night, Burgundy. But you'd better hurry, or else there'll be none left to join with you. Yes, he said, his eyes unfocused. Yes, I... I have to go. The tip of his sword wavered from her throat, and China lashed out, the toe of her expensive boot crunching into his knee. He fell back, and Skullduggery rose, grabbed Dalrymple's sword hand, and wrenched it behind him, breaking it. Dalrymple screamed, and the sword dropped, and Skullduggery threw him against the wall. Give me your half of the key, Skullduggery said, his voice cold, devoid of humanity. Dalrymple sobbed in pain. He tried to run for the door, but Skullduggery kicked his feet from under him. He stomped on Dalrymple's broken arm, and the poor man screeched until he passed out. China stood up as Skullduggery searched him, finally finding the key on a light chain around the unconscious man's neck. Are you okay? Skullduggery asked China as he examined the flat piece of gold. I'm fine, she replied. How are you? He hurts you, I see. Just a scratch. Just enough to make you lose your sense of humor? He looked at her. Only temporarily, I assure you. I'm right as rain now, though. We have one half of the key. Valkyrie has the other. We might actually win this, you know, even against overwhelming odds. China shrugged. Stranger things have happened. Chapter 44 Siege at the Hibernian Skullduggery and China arrived in Drogheda, and they all got into the nice warm van. Tanith immediately told them that Valkyrie had beaten up a priest and an old woman. China laughed, and Skullduggery handed Valkyrie the half of the key he'd recovered from Dalrymple. She pressed it against the half from the church, and was unable to pry them apart again. They got onto the motorway, and drove without seeing another car until they got to the slipway for Balbrigan. Two cars were stopped in the middle lane, the doors open, and no one around. A crash? Tanith asked as they drove slowly by. Valkyrie could see no sign of collision, and she got the uncomfortable feeling that they were being watched. Skullduggery pressed down on the accelerator. We don't stop, he said, for anyone. Neither Valkyrie or Tanith said anything. They reached the city centre and cut through the empty streets, ignoring traffic lights. At the entrance to Trinity College, a grit spreader was pulled into the side of the road with its lights on and its engine running, but there was no sign of the driver. They swung around St. Stephen's Green and saw a man running up to them, waving his arms frantically. Valkyrie looked away as they left him behind, the city was dead around them, killed by cold and fear. Checkpoint, Skullduggery said, as his facade flowed over his skull. Valkyrie peered out at the flashing blue lights of the guard of squad cars ahead of them. Four cops in reflective jackets waved them down. Valkyrie and Tanith lay flat in the back. Valkyrie's heart was thumping wildly by the time the van stopped. She heard the window whir down and a cop asking Skullduggery for his driver's license. China asked if there was a problem. The cop stammered a little when he replied that this was just a, a routine checkpoint, nothing to worry about. At least his love-struck reaction to China's sorrows was a normal response. That was a good start. But when Skullduggery told him that he didn't have his license on him, the cop ordered him to step out of the van. Is there a problem? Skullduggery asked. Just step out of the van, sir, the cop replied. We weren't speeding guard. Sir, the cop said, irritation creeping into his voice. I'm telling you to step out of the van. You can either do as I ask, or we'll pull you out and arrest you. There's no need for threats, Skullduggery said. Valkyrie heard the door open, and Skullduggery got out. The door closed. There's four of them, China whispered from the front. One on my side, three around Skullduggery. There was a knock on the passenger side window. China wound it down. Hello there, Valkyrie heard a cop say. 
Hello, China said back, a smile in her voice. Valkyrie noticed Tanith moving slightly. The streetlight glinted briefly across the steel of her sword. Valkyrie swallowed. There was a short cry from outside. Then something slammed into the side of the van at the same time as China kicked her door open. The sound of the door hitting the cop's head was unmistakable. China closed her door calmly as Skullduggery got back behind the wheel, and they sped on. Trouble? Tanith asked, sitting up. Nothing I couldn't talk my way out of, Skullduggery replied. Valkyrie looked out the back window at the crumpled forms of the guards. Were they possessed? I don't think so, China said. They didn't seem especially strong. All it takes is one remnant in a position of power, Skullduggery said. For all we know, they could have the entire police force on the lookout for us. Everyone hold on. We're going to be moving a little faster. He pressed his foot down on the accelerator, and the van roared. By the time they reached the Hibernian, Valkyrie was scared and depressed. She worried about her parents, and for the first time she worried about her cousins. She wondered how they were coping with what they'd learned over the past twenty-four hours. The events they'd witnessed, plus the madness breaking out all over the city, all over the country, would be enough to freak anyone out, let alone two highly strung teenagers. According to the radio, the entire country was, understandably, panicking. The authorities were inundated with reports of missing people. Some commentators were saying this was a neurological virus. Others said it was a biological attack. And still others were saying, and this was Valkyrie's personal favourite, that this was God's punishment for not going to church anymore. Some of the attacks reported were genuine remnant activity, but others were clearly down to Ken Speckle's time-released thought bomb. Whatever the cause, the effect was the same. People were staying in, locking their doors and windows, and isolating themselves from their neighbours. There were reports of scientists in hazmat suits walking the streets. The country was going crazy, and the rest of the world was just waiting for the sickness to spread to them. Skullduggery parked Ghastly's van across the road from the Hibernian and out of sight. Making sure no one was watching, they hurried over to the locked door at the rear of the cinema. A hidden camera picked them up, and a few moments later the door clicked. They hurried inside, and the moment the door closed again, it locked, sliding steel bars into place and activating an alarm system that Ken Speckle himself had designed. Ghastly called, Ken Speckle said when he saw them. He said they're three hours away if they're lucky. Skullduggery sent Tanith to check defences on the upper levels, and he took Valkyrie with him as he checked the lower ones. When do you think the possessed will get here? Valkyrie asked as they walked. Any time now. To be honest, I am surprised they're not here already. I don't like waiting, Valkyrie said. I think too much and I think of everything that could go wrong with this dreadful plan of ours. Surely not everything. You are of no reassurance at all, do you know that? If you were any kind of a friend, you'd be telling me that in a few hours the remnants will be gone and everyone will be back to normal. You mean if I was a true friend, Skullduggery said, I'd take this opportunity to lie to you. Pretty much yes. In that case... This dreadful plan cannot fail. In a few hours, the remnants will be trapped in the receptacle, and everyone will be back to normal. People can carry on arguing about who should be the two new elders. I can get back to tracking down this Tesseract character, and you can continue your lessons in necromancy while you go on another date with Fletcher, as Caelan seethes with jealousy on the sidelines. He tested iron shutters that were sealing off an old doorway. You notice everything, she said. Not everything, but a lot. He told me he loves me, Valkyrie said. Kalen. They resumed their walk. You don't want a vampire loving you, Valkyrie. He's not a bad person. Because he's not a person. Don't give me that, she said irritably. 
That's all anyone ever says. He's an animal. He can't be trusted. That's what he says, too. He calls himself an animal, for God's sake. And what do you think he is? Troubled? Misunderstood? He's a killer. Caelan is different from the others. Yes, he is. Valkyrie frowned. You agree with me? Absolutely. The other vampires are brutal, bloodthirsty animals, barely held in check by their brutal, bloodthirsty code. But Caelan, he's much worse. She sighed and shook her head, but he continued. He broke the first law of being a vampire when he killed his own kind. If he can't stick to that simple rule, how safe do you think you are? Do you know why vampires are known for holding grudges? It's because once a passion for something... In that case, vengeance starts to burn. It consumes them absolutely. Vengeance, hatred, or love. They each burn as bright. So you're saying he'll become obsessed with me? If he told you he loves you, he's already obsessed with you. If you talk to him, if you sat down and gave him a chance, you'd realize how wrong you are. Skullduggery didn't say anything. He just looked at her then slowly cocked his head to one side. Valkyrie looked away, aware of the blush that was rising. What did you do? he asked. I didn't do anything. What are you talking about? Loath as I am to protect your relationship with Fletcher, you are still with the boy, aren't you? Of course. You're not with Caelan, then? She shook her head. And you have no plans to be with him? He's way too old. That's not an answer. But I don't know what you want me to say. Do you want me to say we kissed? Because okay, we did. Once, that's all. And I said never again because I'm with Fletcher and he agreed. There, what else do you want to know? Skullduggery said nothing, just kept walking. She felt the flash of righteous anger fading fast, leaving her feeling stupid and childish and really wishing she hadn't said anything. I see he said at last. I don't have to explain myself to you, said Valkyrie. I don't need to get your permission to kiss Caelan or Fletcher or anyone. That's right, he said quietly. You don't. But we still have the problem of a vampire being in love with you. I told you, it's not a problem. You can't afford to encourage him, she glared. I'm not encouraging him. Then kissing him probably sends the wrong signal. Valkyrie looked away, unable to argue with him there. And what if Fletcher finds out? Skullduggery continued. Are you willing to lose your boyfriend over this? Caelan may be on his best behavior with you, but by now, I can assure you, he is hating Fletcher. A hint, a suggestion, that's all it would take to ruin things between you two. Caelan's not going to say anything, she said, without conviction. Then the lights went out. Before Valkyrie could even click her fingers, the emergency generator activated. Power cut, she asked, or... Remnants, Skullduggery said. They're here. They ran back to the others. Ken Speckle had a screen set up in the medical bay that showed multiple shots of the building's exteriors. There were hundreds of them, men and women and even a few children, mortal and sorcerer all of them out there in the freezing cold with black-lipped smiles on their black-veined faces. Valkyrie could see wreath and shudder and ravel and a few other people she recognized. There was movement in the crowd around the main door and Tesseract walked forward. He looked straight up into the camera. Valkyrie felt the fear in her gut and the cold, cold guilt. A part of her, a despairing part, wailed and cried that they were here for her, that this was all her fault. It wasn't, of course. The remnants getting free had nothing to do with her, as far as she knew. If they hadn't come after her, they'd still be out there, still hurting people and taking over bodies. This way, at least, they weren't targeting mortals. For the moment. They watched the screens as the possessed spread out, wrapping around the building like a noose on a neck. A few of them approached the perimeter on the west side. One of them waved a stick at the air until it hit the invisible dome Ken Speckle had set up. The dome glowed blue at the point where the stick touched it, 
and the blue rippled outwards and gradually dissipated, like a pebble thrown into a still lake. The possessed let out a chorus of appreciation for such fine defensive work. On the street-facing side, a saucer hurled a stream of energy that was soaked up into the blue without causing damage. A ball of fire exploded against it. Bullets hit and dropped harmlessly, and a fist of shadows broke apart on impact. All those attacks did was send ripples of blue around the little building. A group of the possessed broke off from the rest, started using their magic to blast away at the ground. They're digging under, Valkyrie said. They're going to have to dig deep, Ken Speckle told her. We're not encased in a bubble, but the dome does continue down into the earth for about ten meters. It's not going to be easy for them. How long till they break through? asked Tanith. The dome will not fail completely, Ken Speckle said. But some gaps may start to appear. We can expect some of them to get through before the dome repairs itself. I don't mind that at all, Tanith shrugged. Just don't want to get bored. Valkyrie didn't say it, but looking down at the hundreds of murderous, black-lipped faces, she didn't think there'd be much chance of that. Spread out, Skullduggery said, but not too far. We go where we're needed, but we don't go alone. Is that understood? Our aim is to defend and repel attacks until Fletcher teleports back to us. Until then, we do not rest and we do not stop. Let's go. Under sustained attacks, gaps were appearing, and sorcerers were getting through to the building itself. There were further defences there, of course, and even more inside, but little by little the building was breached. Valkyrie was down in the morgue, watching helplessly as a large hole was blasted through the wall and three sorcerers jumped through. Skullduggery ran to intercept the intruders. He pushed at the air and sent one of them back to the dome. The other two were elementals and knew how to meet the rush of air without losing ground. The biggest of them, an ugly man with curly black hair, slammed into Skullduggery and took him down. The other one, dressed in a suit and tie spattered with mud, went for Valkyrie. She dropped, right before he reached her, sweeping his feet from under him. He hit the floor, and she gripped him with shadows, threw him spinning to the side of the morgue. The smack his head made against the concrete was wet and sickening. The man with the curly hair punched Skullduggery's head, grunting as his hand broke. Skullduggery kicked him away and rolled to his feet, slid sideways to avoid a lunge from the third intruder. His hand came around, caught the guy behind the ear, sending him stumbling. Valkyrie pushed at the air, directing it at the guy's feet. His legs flew out behind him, and he fell, and she ran up and volleyed his head like a football. Skullduggery whipped an elbow into the curly-haired man's nose. The remnants were strong, and their sensitivity to pain was lessened, but they were still in human bodies, and human bodies had certain reactions to certain things. An elbow to the nose causes the eyes to water, which blurs the vision. A kick to the shin sends signals shooting into the brain, which, in turn, brings the hands down to protect the injured area. And a knee to the chin rocks the head back, which makes the brain slam into the wall of the skull, which results in blackout. The man with the curly hair dropped like a sack of ugly potatoes. Through the hole in the wall, Valkyrie could see the blue energy of the dome, and the possessed on the other side. She barely resisted the urge to shout, That all you got? The urge came from fear and the expectation of the inevitable, like when she was a kid playing hide-and-seek, and she'd be consumed by the need to lunge from her hiding place as the seeker grew close and shout, I'm here, I'm here. She wasn't a kid any more, and those kinds of self-destructive urges had no place in her life, especially now. The possessed looked at her and smiled. A few of them chanted her true name. She just stood there beside Skullduggery and waited for the next lot to break through. Chapter 45 Frightening Tanith knew the sorcerer striding through the laboratory towards her. His skin was dark as ebony, 
his body big and broad, and his eyes burning. He had taken the sword that fitted so comfortably in his hand from a vanquished opponent on the battlefield long ago, and it had served him well ever since. He was an adept. His name was Frightening Jones, and they had briefly dated back in the 1970s. His sword came for her, and she slipped to the side, tried to sweep her own blade along the back of his leg, but he was already pivoting. Steel clashed, and Tanith backed off. I've missed you, he smiled. Have you been? she muttered. He shrugged, and sent the tip of his sword whistling for her throat. She dodged away. I'm doing all right, he said, continuing his advance. I was just over here for a bit of business, and then, well, you know, he tapped his head. It's really not as bad as you think, sharing space with a remnant. Although, to be fair, this new joining hasn't made me appreciate Irish weather to any great degree. Still looking forward to being back in Africa. He lunged, and she parried, flicked her sword to his shoulder, and he raised his blade, and her cut went wide. What about you? he asked. Anyone special in your life? Oh, frightening, you know you're the only one for me. He laughed, and she pressed in, and now it was he who was forced to retreat. His defense was strong, the steel of his blade backed up by muscle and sinew. It flickered where it needed to flicker, and his feet moved where they needed to move. He was still good. He hadn't let his skills diminish. Tanith wondered if he was still better than she was. He blocked a cut and shuffled forward, using his shoulder to knock her sideways. She flipped backwards to avoid the swipe to her knees, parried the follow-up, and avoided the next strike altogether. When you've quite finished dancing, China said as she strolled by. Frightening moved round so that he could keep both of them in view. Miss Sorrows, he said. So good to see you again. If you wait right there, I'll get around to killing you as soon as possible. China folded her arms. I haven't got all day, Mr. Jones. Frightening brought his sword down on Tanith's, nearly ripping it out of her hands. He stepped up and booted her in the gut. She staggered, half bent over, and barely managed to roll away from the next assault. Well, Tanith gasped to China. China's eyebrow raised. Well, what? Are you going to help me or not? Nonsense. You don't need my help. You're doing fine. Frightening fainted low, then brought the sword high. Tanith blocked, replied with three strikes in quick succession. The first two he batted aside with ease, but the third he let sail overhead as he ducked below it, bringing his blade dangerously close to her ribs. She darted away just in time. Three more possessed sorcerers came through. China turned to them, arms still folded, her fingers briefly touching the invisible symbols carved into her forearms. Her arms flew wide, and the nearest possessed caught a wave of blue energy at point-blank range. His bones broke, and his flesh ruptured, even as he was sent flying backwards. The other two remnants rounded on China, just as Frightening renewed his attack on Tanith. Tanith stumbled as she parried and blocked, trying to regain her footing and give herself some space at the same time. An almighty swing from Frightening took the sword from her hands. Instead of retreating further, she surprised him by leaping forward. They struggled with his sword, Tanith kicking and kneeing at his legs the whole time. She sneaked a boot around his foot and pushed into him. He went back, tripping over her, but bringing her with him. He grunted as she landed on top of him. Using her full weight, she pressed the sword down against his throat. Teeth gritted and perspiration dotting his forehead, he resisted. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw China fling a dagger of red light into the chest of one of the possessed. He gasped and sagged, fell to his knees, and keeled over. The remaining sorcerer grabbed China and slammed her against the wall. Frightening was pushing back, the blade moving away from his throat with astonishing slowness. It was all Tanith could do to watch the inevitable happen. In another few seconds, the blade would be far enough away for Frightening to start squirming beneath her. He'd throw her off, the battle would resume, and she'd more than likely die. She thought of Ghastly, 
of the brief kiss she'd given him. All that time wasted. To die here and now, killed on this cold ground by a man she had cared for, yet never loved, it was almost more than she could bear. She had thought she had all the time in the world to find the right moment with Ghastly. The curse of immortality, she reckoned, was procrastination. Tanith flipped her body vertically, till she was in a handstand with both hands still on the sword. Frightening's eyes widened as her full weight bore down on him, but her balance was easily shifted. She sprang away before he could try anything tricky, snatching up her sword as he got to his feet. China, meanwhile, was getting down and dirty with the remaining mage. They rolled across the ground, China's hair in her face. Finally, China simply grabbed the sorcerer's head and slammed it down on the concrete, once, twice. Satisfied that her opponent was no longer a threat, she got up, breathing hard and looking angry. The pupils dissolved in Frightening's eyes, leaving them pure white and glowing. Tanith cursed, had to dive to avoid the stream of white light that burst out. She got behind a metal desk, felt the heat and heard the metal sizzle all around her. Abruptly, the light moved, and she peered out, saw Frightening closing in on China. China's forearms were pressed together, forming the sigil that erected the shield between her and Frightening's eye beams. Tanith had always thought those eye beams were amongst the coolest of adept powers to have. She didn't think that they were quite so cool today. Keep the shield up, she shouted. He can't sustain that level of intensity for more than a few seconds. If you're bored, China shouted back, you could always lend a hand. Nonsense, you're doing great. Frightening swiveled his head, the twin beams scorching towards her, forcing Tanith to duck back behind cover. She felt the heat die and the brightness falter and risked another peek to see Frightening blinking his pupils back into service. Now, she called, lunging from cover. For a few moments after using his power, Frightening was left blind as his magic recharged. China hit him from the side, and Tanith leaped, both boots crunching into his jaw. He sprawled, his sword clanging to the floor. In an instant, China was leaning over him, her hand pressing against his forehead. He screamed, then went silent, but China kept her hand on his forehead, making his body jerk. Tanith grabbed China and yanked her back. China's elbow cracked against Tanith's cheek, and Tanith held up her hands. Stop! Wait! What the hell was that? China narrowed her eyes. You attacked me? No, I didn't. Yes, you did. You're one of them. Tanith stared at her. Did you see a remnant slide down my throat? No, you bloody didn't. Then why did you stop me? Because you were going to kill him. He was going to kill us, you stupid girl. No, China, he was going to lie there and be unconscious. Once that thing is out of him, he's a good guy again. The same goes for most of these people that you don't seem to have a problem using lethal force against. Without taking her eyes from Tanith's, China tied her hair back off her face. If it's a choice between them or me, I pick me. Your little concessions of mercy are going to get you killed. Tanith wiped blood from her lip and didn't respond. Chapter 46 According to Plan The shield held. Its colour deepened with each impact. With each attempt to break through, it would darken then fade, and then the attacks would begin again, and the Hibernian cinema would be covered by a blue dome of energy. The sorcerers outside were taking turns, fifty of them each time, throwing everything they had at Ken Speckle's defences. The defenders went where they were needed, constantly repelling attacks and forcing back intruders. It was exhausting. Valkyrie fought her way from one side of the building to the other and back again, she was cut and bleeding and bruised, and she couldn't catch her breath. There was a crash from a corridor behind her, and she heard Tanith shout, They're in! Valkyrie ran to help. Tanith was locked in a struggle with a black-lipped sorcerer, the pair of them rolling amid the debris around the massive hole in the middle of the floor. Another sorcerer was climbing up, and Valkyrie snapped her palm at the air, 
sending a rock hurtling into his face. The sorcerer fell back with a scream of pain, but another one took his place before the scream was even half done. A flash of red light blinded her, and she felt something hot sizzle by her cheek. She stumbled back, hands out against the air. There was a disturbance, something big coming for her. She clicked her fingers and flicked out a fireball, heard rapid cursing in response. She blinked quickly, able to see shapes now, and she saw the figure as he batted out the flames on his shirt. She gathered shadows and sent them roughly to where his head should be. His blurred form spun in midair and dropped. Valkyrie squeezed her eyes shut, then opened them, vision clearing. In time to see Tanith rising off the unconscious sorcerer she had been struggling with. Another black-lipped man climbed up into the room, and Tanith met him, ducking the swipe of a knife and firing back three punches in return. The man grunted, and the knife dropped. Tanith caught him with a kick that toppled him backwards into the hole. Skullduggery ran in, fire in both his hands. He stopped in the middle of the room and sent twin streams of flame down into the hole. Valkyrie heard screams and shouts and a lot more cursing. Suddenly, he doused the flames and crouched. Fingers splayed out on the ground. The floor rumbled, cracked, and belched clouds of dust into the air as the tunnel caved in beneath them. Skullduggery looked up. Everyone okay? Tanith nodded. Valkyrie raised an eyebrow. Another one of your new tricks? She panted. Just the natural progression of earth manipulation. I'll have to teach it to you sometime. It won't hold them for long, Tanith said. The possessed were inside the cinema, and they were trying to get through into the science magic facility. Valkyrie heard a terrified scream, and she split off from the rest. She rounded the corner to see a woman with wild, bushy hair closing in on Clarabel. Valkyrie dived on her. Run, she said to Clarabel, and Clarabel did. The woman elbowed her, and Valkyrie heard a crackle just as the woman brought up a stun gun. Valkyrie dodged back, stumbled, and fell backwards. She was so tired, her body so drained, that when she hit the ground, it actually felt good to be lying down. Then the crazy woman jumped on her, and it didn't feel so good anymore. The stun gun crackled centimetres from her neck, and Valkyrie did her best to keep it away. You'll thank me for this later, the crazy woman said through gritted teeth. Valkyrie braced her forearm against the lower half of the woman's face and slowly forced it back. She was running on pure adrenaline, and she was down to her last reserves. The crazy woman grinned, and Valkyrie's strength failed. A moment before the stun gun pressed into her skin, Fletcher grabbed the woman and yanked her off. They vanished, and Valkyrie sank back. Slowly and with a moan, she raised both arms up. Fletcher reappeared above her, took her hands, and pulled her to her feet. I'm getting pretty good at this nick of time stuff, aren't I? He asked. She would have hit him if she wasn't so tired. Skullduggery ran over, China and Tanith behind him. Fletcher, did you make it to the mountains? Yes, we did, Fletcher said. We don't know where the cavern is exactly, but I can definitely teleport to the general area. You're the only one immune to the remnants, China said to Skullduggery. When we get there, we'll do our best to hold them off while you activate the machine. From this point on, you're the only one who matters. I got Ken Speckle to open a few doors, Gasty said, hurrying over. So they're all flowing into the cinema. We need them in one place, and we're not going to get a better chance than right now. Skullduggery turned to Valkyrie. Are you ready? She nodded. I can do it. Fletcher, they're going to be focused on the screen, trying to get through. You need to teleport us behind them, and then be ready to teleport everyone to the McGillicuddy's Reeks. Can you do that? I can, Fletcher said. Everybody, hold hands now. Suddenly, they were in the cinema, watching two thousand crazy people as they shouted and laughed and cursed. Valkyrie, Skullduggery said. Now! She reached out, allowing the coldness of the ring to spread to her fingertips, 
The shadows swirled and rose like a dark mist. The noise gradually died down as the possessed swiped the mist, expecting an attack. When none came, they looked around, confused. Valkyrie felt the shadows drift between them and concentrated on spreading it out further. She opened her eyes, saw them all looking at her. Fletcher, Skullduggery barked. Everyone hang on, Fletcher said. His hand gripped Valkyrie's shoulder. The others formed a chain on the other side of her. I'm not the one moving, she heard him murmur. It's the universe that revolves around me. Valkyrie saw it out of the corner of her eye, a sliver of blackness reaching from behind Fletcher's shoulder. Before she could warn him, the remnant scampered up to his face, and he stumbled back, trying to tear it away. He fell to one knee, but it was already in his mouth. He reared back, and it was gone from sight, and his body arched in pain, then relaxed. All around them, the possessed were laughing. Fletcher raised his head and smiled with black lips. Skullduggery's gun leaped into his hand, but Fletcher disappeared. Over here, Fletcher said. They spun. Ghastly pushed at the air, but Fletcher was already gone. He appeared beside Tanith, who whirled in an instant, her sword slicing through nothing but empty space. You can't beat me, Fletcher said from behind them. Skullduggery fired, and China hurled daggers of red light. <laughs> How stupid are you? Fletcher called from the stage. I can be everywhere and anywhere, Fletcher said from ten paces away. <laughs> you can't stop me, Fletcher laughed from right beside them. He grabbed Valkyrie, pulling her from the others, and teleported her to the middle of the possessed sorcerers. The dark mist was already gone. The sorcerers around them started to chuckle, she glimpsed Skullduggery and the others through the gaps, but they were being ignored now that the remnants had their prize. I love you, Fletcher said, holding her close. I was pretty sure I loved you before this, but now, now I know. I love you more than anything, Val, and please trust me. When you're joined, you'll like it. Valkyrie punched him right across the jaw, elbowed a woman who reached for her, and kicked out at a man. Someone tripped her, and she fell. The people laughed, and then she felt hands grabbing her from beneath, and she sank into the ground. The sorcerers dived for her, but it was no use, and she shut her eyes as she was pulled down underground. Hello, little darling, Billy Ray Sanguine said in her ear. Chapter 47 Strange Bedfellows The rumbling stopped, and Valkyrie felt the cold, hard earth all around her. It was pitch black, and the familiar fears rose in her throat. Her thumb pressed against her index finger. If you're planning on clicking those fingers and generating a little flame to see by, Sanguine said, may I suggest an alternative that will not burn up your remaining oxygen? Yellow light flooded the small space that surrounded them, and Valkyrie found herself looking at her own reflection in his sunglasses. He handed her the narrow torch. Got this for you, he said, his perfect white teeth flashing in a smile. What are you doing? she whispered. I ain't exactly sure on this, he replied. But it looks to me, and I may be wrong, but it looks to me like I'm saving your life. Yep, I... I think that's what it is. She frowned. You're not one of them? The remnants? No, they haven't got me yet. Creepy critters, ain't they? Valkyrie shifted a little. A half dozen rocks were sticking painfully into her. Why are you here? Now, before you get all aggressive, let me say that I do remember the last time we met, and I do remember the promise you made me. I said I'd kill you. I told you I remember, didn't I? Sanguine said crossly. No need to threaten me again, just because you can. Fact is, I was planning on leaving you alone for a while, but a job came up and I needed my payment. 
How are you mixed up in this? For once, I'm on the side of the angels. If those Warhaven folk can be described as such, they hired me to help out against the creepy critters. I had a look, saw that they seemed to be going after you all the time, so I figured the best way to hurt them is to take away the thing they want. I admit the thought did enter my mind to kill you, and so take you away from them on a more permanent basis. But two factors stopped me from that course of action. The first factor is that, for all I know, the reason they want you so bad is to kill you. And so, by killing you myself, I'd be doing them one hell of a favor. The second factor is that I don't want you dead just yet. I'm quite looking forward to all the pain and torture I know you got coming to you. You're on our side. That appears to be what I'm trying to say. So, you'll be fighting beside us? It'll be strange, not trying to cut your throat all the time, but yeah. Valkyrie pushed questions and suspicions and misgivings out of her mind. Okay, fine. We need to get into the medical bay to get Ken Speckle and Clarabelle, and then we have to get to the van on the other side of the street. In a sec, she glared. Let's go. You ain't my damn boss, Kane. For your information, whatever force field thing you guys cooked up means I have to go deeper than usual to get around it, which means I have to work harder. We'll move when we're able to move. You're still injured? Yes, he said, his mouth twisting into an ugly sneer. I'm still injured from when you cut me with a damn sword. I'm still unable to move with my usual efficiency. Now, if this inconveniences you, please accept my heartfelt apologies. But once again, I must let it be known that this is your damn fault. The look on his face and the hate in his voice told Valkyrie to tread cautiously. He was a killer and a psychopath, and although he may have temporarily switched sides, she knew it wouldn't take a lot for him to abandon her down here. Bet you never thought we'd end up on the same side, huh? He asked, a new smile crossing his features. Bet you never thought I'd save your skin. What? Just making small talk. Gotta distract myself from the pain, you know. Life has a funny way of working out, don't it? Take your friend, for example, the sword lady. Tanith. First time we met, we were trying to kill each other. Remember that? But every time subsequent to that, there's been a kind of a frisson between us. A what? Frisson. It's French for. To be honest, I don't really know what it's French for. But I know what it means in American. A sort of electrical undercurrent of emotion. I know what Frisa means, but I really don't think Tanith would share your view. You're a kid. You don't know the ways of men folk and women folk. All those threats she fires my way, that there is the mark of flirtation. Oh, dear God, Valkyrie said, the color draining from her face. You fancy Tanith. I don't fancy her. I... You have a crush on Tanith. That is disgusting. What? Why would that be disgusting? Because you're a hired killer. That don't make it disgusting. Just makes it unusual. Does she talk about me? Somebody shoot me. What does she say? I'm a formidable foe, right? Does she say anything in a kind of a more wistful voice? I don't want to talk about this. Does she ever say... If only he were good. Stop your talking. Stop it right now. Stop it. She has a boyfriend. His face fell. Someone I know? He asked morosely. He may have punched you a few times. Yes. She's not. She's not dating the skeleton, is she? Ah, oh, how would that be even possible, let alone nice? He's got no skin or lips or nothing. And he talks. Good God, he talks and he never shuts up. It's not skullduggery. Well then, uh, who else could it be? It's not the ugly fella, is it? Oh, it couldn't be the ugly fella. Don't call him ugly. Oh, it is him! But he's all scars. I mean, I know I ain't got no eyes, but once you get past that, you got my face. And my face is all right. Better in his. 
His is a mess. Like he was dropped headfirst into a blender as a kid. Seriously? She's with him? Seriously. And you're not going to break them up. Not because you won't try, but because you won't be able to. Look, are you ready yet? Can we move now? I'm ready, he snapped. But this conversation stays between us, understand? My romancing ain't gonna work if she knows it's coming. Believe me, I never want to speak to anyone about this ever again. Sanguine took a breath and clenched his jaw, and Valkyrie clung on tight. They burrowed through the ground, the rumbling like thunder in her ears. She spat out dirt, keeping her eyes closed. Eventually, she felt their trajectory shift. They were headed upwards now, but moving slower and slower with each passing second. They broke through to light. They weren't in the medical bay, but they were close enough. She left him panting on the ground. Stay here, she said, and catch your breath. I'll be back in a minute. Missing you already, he managed. Valkyrie took off running. She called Ken Speckle's name, then Clarabelle's. She knew Ken Speckle wouldn't allow himself to be taken over again, but she didn't know quite how far he'd go to stop that from happening. Would he hurt himself? Would he do worse? Ken Speckle, she shouted. We have to go. Clarabelle? Getting no answer, she ran the length of the corridor and turned into the next one. She called again for Ken Speckle and passed yet another darkened room. Drip. She stopped and turned. Slowly, she retraced her steps. She listened intently. Drip. Drip, drip. Valkyrie pressed her shoulder to the wall, centimeters from the doorway. Hello, she said softly. Ken Speckle? Clarabelle? Drip. Ken Speckle, it's me, it's Valkyrie. Are you in there? Still no answer. Still no sound, apart from that irregular dripping. I'm coming in, she said, and stepped into the room. She poured her magic into a flame, and it burned fiercely, throwing light across the countertops and equipment to each of the four corners. A warm, flickering light that illuminated Ken Speckle Grouse as he lay on the table and Clarabelle, his assistant, as she crouched on top of him, a scalpel in each hand. Ken Speckle's eyes were open and unseeing, and the work Clarabelle had been doing reminded Valkyrie of her own dissection just a few days earlier. Blood covered him and dripped to a puddle on the floor. Clarabelle screeched, her lips black and her skin riddled with veins. She leaped off the old man's corpse and fell onto Valkyrie. They sprawled out through the door, landing in the corridor, those scalpers whipping at Valkyrie like snakes. Valkyrie seized one of Clarabelle's wrists, held the blade away from her, tried to block the other one, but it bit into her face and scraped along her cheekbone. Warm blood flowed. Valkyrie cried out, and anger coursed through her, giving her the strength to throw Clarabelle off. She got up, grabbed a metal tray, and swung it into the back of Clarabelle's head. She hit her again, and again, and wouldn't let up. Valkyrie battered her until Clarabelle dropped to the floor and didn't move. Valkyrie threw the tray to one side and ran. The corridors twisted and turned. Valkyrie's hand was at her face, the blood pouring through her fingers. She slowed, panting, and heard voices. She crept forward, peering round the corner. Shudder and Tesseract were heading her way, followed by several other sorcerers, including Fletcher. We're going to have to break her, Fletcher was saying. You don't know her, not like I do. Leave Darkest to us, Tesseract said. But that's it, right there, that's your problem. She's not Darkest, not yet. She's still Valkyrie. We'll never convince her to embrace her inner mass murderer unless we cut off the things that she clings to. And your suggestion? asked Shudder. Valkyrie ducked into a doorway as they neared. I'll go to pick up her parents. 
she heard Fletcher say, and her stomach lurched. I'll bring them back here and kill them in front of her. And what will this accomplish? Tesseract asked. Apart from making her hate us so much, she never gives in. No, Valkyrie must become darkest willingly. We leave her family alone for now. Valkyrie stayed where she was, crouched in the darkness as they walked away, trying to get her breathing under control. Her hands were shaking as she took her phone from her pocket. She thumbed a button and called her reflection. Take my parents out of the house, she whispered. The reflection's voice was as cold and uninterested as ever. Why? They're in danger. Fletcher's been possessed. Take them somewhere, not to Beryl's. Fletcher knows where they live. I don't care where you take them. Just get them out of the house. Hello, baby, said Fletcher from right behind her. Valkyrie twisted, but he was already gone. Something hit her hand and her phone went flying. She swung a fist in an arc, but didn't catch him. And then he was behind her again, and his fist crunched into the back of her head. She dropped to all fours, hair in her face, stunned. He grabbed her and hauled her up, threw her over a table, and teleported to the other side as she landed on the ground. He kicked her, the remnant inside him adding to his strength. She curled up, struggling for air. I thought I heard you, he said. He was smiling, that cute smile she liked so much. When I said I wanted to kill your folks, I thought I heard something, a little gasp. I knew it was you. Valkyrie turned over, gave a moan of pain. I'll bring you to the others in a bit, Fletcher said. Don't you worry about that. I just thought it'd be nice if we spent a few minutes alone. I thought you might want to talk or something. She moved quickly, pushing at the air, sending the table hurtling to the other end of the room. But not Fletcher. Fletcher wasn't there anymore. She sensed him behind her, but was too slow to do anything as he grabbed her under the jaw with both hands and started dragging her across the floor. Knew you were fooling, he said. I know you too well, see. Can't bluff me, babe. Valkyrie grabbed his wrist to ease the pressure and swung her legs up and over in a backward somersault. Her boots caught him in the face, and he let go, cursing. She was up now. She took hold of the shadows in the room, and they lifted him up and slammed him to the ground. She glanced at the door, but she couldn't outrun a teleporter, and she knew it. She aimed a kick at his head. He moved at the last second, rolled away, tried to come up, but her knee caught him under the chin. He fell back, and she pressed in. If she gave him even a moment to recover, he'd teleport. She got behind him and wrapped one arm around his throat, braced it with the other, going for a choke. Fletcher reared back, but she hung on. He heaved forward, lifting her off her feet, trying to shake her loose. She tightened her hold. The remnant might not need air to function, but the body it was using sure did. Another few moments, and Fletcher would be unconscious. He stopped trying to pry her fingers back, and instead staggered to a chair that stood against the wall. He put one foot up on the seat. Valkyrie wriggled, did her best to throw him off balance, but didn't dare loosen the choke. Grunting, Fletcher shifted his weight forward and slowly stood up on the chair, taking Valkyrie with him. She screamed a thousand curses in her mind, but there was nothing she could do, as Fletcher stood on shaky legs and then propelled himself backwards. They fell in silence, Valkyrie shutting her eyes and waiting for the impact. She hit the ground and her head smacked off it, and stars burst behind her eyelids. She wasn't even aware that she'd lost the choke. She wasn't even aware of Fletcher getting to his feet beside her. She just lay there. Wow! You're tough, she heard Fletcher say. His voice sounded dim. I'm not mad, I'm not. This is good. Darkest is going to have to be tough, am I right? His image came into view. But wow, you nearly got me there. You nearly had me. If I didn't have all this extra strength, I'd be out cold. I think I like that. You know, my girlfriend being stronger than me. I'd never admit it. Well, the old me wouldn't. 
but the new me is a lot more self-assured. Valkyrie moaned, and Fletcher knelt beside her. He gently raised her head off the ground, then slammed it back down again. His hands moved over her, checking her pockets. You know, I fancied you the moment I saw you. I didn't want to admit it, because you were young and, you know, really annoying. But yeah, I liked you. We had something, didn't we? A connection. I like the way you took all of this so seriously. I found that really funny. Ah, here they are. He dangled her own handcuffs over her. I've really liked being your boyfriend, actually. I love all the fun stuff we do. But that's nothing compared to the fun we're going to have. He clicked the cuff onto her right wrist and was going for the left when someone collided with him from behind. They crashed against the chair in the dark. Valkyrie rolled slowly onto her side. Her head hurt and she felt sick, but she brought her legs in and got them under her. In the dark around her were more crashes, the sounds of struggle, two figures throwing each other into walls. She took a deep breath, then another, willing herself not to throw up. Strength was returning with each moment that passed. The world was becoming clearer. She stood. Fletcher came stumbling from the shadows. There was a snarl, and he turned, just as Caelan leapt at him, and they both vanished. Valkyrie frowned, and even as she started to wonder what Caelan was doing here, a wave of dizziness nearly pitched her onto her face. She managed to stay upright and staggered out into the corridor. She slumped against the wall and stayed there, gathering her strength. She took a small key from her pocket, opened the handcuff, and put both away. Warm blood trickled down her face. Her phone was on the floor nearby. She held out her hand. She could feel the air, but it took a few seconds before she could focus enough to pull it towards her. The phone lifted into her hand, and she slipped it into her jacket, then pushed herself away from the wall. Her balance was back. Her strength was back. She was hurting, but she'd get over it. Valkyrie found her way back to Sanguine, who raised an eyebrow as she approached, but didn't say anything. He took her underground, and they moved slowly through the earth and under the street. He was breathing hard, straining against the pain. Finally, she heard shouting. Hands gripped her, pulling her from the ground. They were on the other side of the road, away from the Hibernian. She opened her eyes to see Ghastly dragging Sanguine to his feet. His fist pulled back, ready to punch. She called out, and he looked around, puzzled. Our side! She coughed in Skullduggery's arm. He's on our side. Ghastly frowned at Sanguine and let him go. The Texan dropped to his knees, exhausted and in pain. Valkyrie heard shouting. They've noticed us, said Tanith. Everyone, get to the van, Skullduggery ordered. They ran. The remnants ran behind them. Ghastly jumped in behind the wheel and they took off, tires spinning. Are we going to drive there? Tanith asked. I know this thing is fast, but I don't like the idea of a five-hour car chase on icy roads, and they have Fletcher now. He could teleport all of them to any one of a hundred places he's been between here and Kerry, and we'd drive right into them. Fletcher's distracted, Valkyrie said. I don't know for how long. Caelan was there. He helped me. Ken Speckle's dead. There was a moment of awful calm that Skullduggery quickly dispelled. We need to stay ahead of them, just long enough so we can find somewhere to pull in. We'll let them overshoot, get to carry ahead of us, and we'll take our time, approach it right. It's going to be tricky, Ghastly murmured. It usually is. Chapter 48 Plan Falls Apart Valkyrie chewed on a leaf to numb the pain as Tanith stitched the cut on her face as best she could. When Tanith was finished, Valkyrie sat back and closed her eyes. After an hour of driving, they turned off the main road and bounced down narrow lanes of potholes and ice for twenty minutes, then headed north, moving perpendicular to their destination. 
Valkyrie kept her head down. The van was warm, but it was no comfort. After everything she'd seen and been through, she just wanted her boyfriend's arms around her. Sometimes the most comforting thing in the world was a hug. It got dark, and Ghastly turned the headlights on. They passed three cars in two hours, and with every one, they'd ready themselves for an attack. But the drivers were human and mortal, and no threat to them. Skullduggery asked questions. Sanguine answered them in his lazy drawl. Valkyrie didn't pay attention. She lay down in the back, her head on Tanith's lap, and fell asleep. She woke to a conversation Skullduggery was having with Ghastly about abandoning the van and getting another. Ghastly was insisting on speed. Skullduggery was of the opinion that they should pick the first suitable vehicle they came across. There was no telling when this van would be recognized and reported. Valkyrie dozed off again, only opening her eyes when the van pulled into an all-night petrol station. There was snow outside. Tanith took a few food orders and got out, hurried up to the bored man at the station window. Ghastly activated his facade and went to keep an eye on her, in case the remnants had spread out this way. Valkyrie got out to stand beside Skullduggery while he filled the tank. I know he hid it well, Skullduggery said, but Ken Speckle really liked me. She surprised herself with a small smile. No, he didn't, she said. No, he didn't, but he liked you. I don't really want to talk about this. What is there to say? I can't believe he's gone. Can't believe he's dead. Obviously it's a shock. I don't need to tell anyone that. Sometimes it's not what you say, Valkyrie. It's just the fact that you're saying it. She shook her head. We don't have the time. Fight now, mourn later. That's our thing, right? If we stop and consider the implications every time something bad happens, we'd never get anything done. Ken Speckle was your friend. When all this is over, we'll see who's alive and who's dead, and then I'll cry, okay? He put his hand on her shoulder. Okay. Clarabelle's going to feel so bad when this is done with, Valkyrie said quietly, then shook her head. She had to focus. How far are we from the receptacle? We're less than an hour from the mountain range, but we should wait until morning before approaching. Once we're there, that golden key in your pocket will guide us to where we need to go. Do we have a plan? Plans are an invitation to disappointment. And yet we're probably going to need one. The remnants are going to be all over the place to stop us from reaching the machine. Are you going to fly us in, over their heads? They'll be expecting that. Now that we have Sanguine on our side, we could always burrow right under them. I don't think so. These days he can't go three meters without needing a rest. So we can't go above, and we can't go under. It looks like we're going to drive in as close as we can and just walk right in. The direct approach. The only approach we have left. Morning was slow in coming, and failed to bring with it warmth. Valkyrie's nerves jangled beneath her skin. She noticed Tanith clenching and unclenching her fists beside her, and Ghastly had gone scarily quiet. Only China and Skullduggery seemed unperturbed by the danger they were about to walk into. Valkyrie couldn't have cared less about how Sanguine was coping. They drove deeper into a small town, which seemed to be hibernating under all the snow. Valkyrie longed to see normal people out walking, or buying the morning paper, or even sitting at traffic lights. She didn't like this ghost town thing that had struck and spread, turning Ireland into a ghost country. The van slowed suddenly, pulling into the side of the road. Valkyrie peered over Skullduggery's shoulder. A police car lay on its side at the junction ahead of them, its light still flashing. The rest of you stay here, Skullduggery said. Valkyrie, you're with me. They got out. She slid the door closed and pulled the bandage away from her face. How does it look? He peered at her. 
It's healing. The swelling is gone. It's a nasty scar. But with everything Tanith applied to the wound, it should disappear in a day or so. She glanced back at the van, and her voice lowered. You don't trust them? Not entirely, he admitted. You think one of them's possessed? We have no way of knowing until they reveal themselves. You're to stick with me, okay? Do not allow yourself to be caught alone with any of them. She nodded. Skullduggery held his gloved hand out in front as they approached the car, turning the ice to steam, allowing them a firm grip on the road. Valkyrie wished she could have done that while she was slipping and sliding all over Drogheda. They reached the junction. Two cops lay on the far side of the car. Valkyrie went to one, Skullduggery to the other. She hunkered down, felt for a pulse. This one's alive, she said. This one isn't, Skullduggery replied. But I don't think the remnants are out this far anymore. I'd say they're panicking, keeping everyone back. So they're content to just sit around and wait for us to show up? Why not? They know we have to go to them eventually. They probably have a few scouts flying around, checking the perimeter. We'll have to be very careful from here on out. They turned and retraced their steps. Sanguine walked towards them. Get back in the van, Skullduggery said. We may, Sanguine responded, his words slurring like he was drunk. Have a bit of a problem. And then he collapsed. A stream of red light hit Skullduggery and blasted him back all the way to the junction, where he hit the overturned police car and flipped over it. Valkyrie jumped sideways. She could see Ghastly lying on the road beneath the open door of the van, and then China strolling towards her with a beautiful, black-lipped smile. Valkyrie raised her hand, but China flicked a dagger of red light into her. It hit her jacket, and it was like she had stuck her fingers into an electrical socket. She jerked back and fell to her knees. It's time to come with me, China said. You've impressed all of us, but really, you didn't need to. You're Darkess. That's all we needed to know. China crouched over her and took the golden key from Valkyrie's jacket and put it in her own pocket. I don't think this is going to be much use to you, to be perfectly honest. Someone moved around the van. Valkyrie's vision cleared, just as Tanith collided with China from behind. They slipped on the ice and went down, but Tanith instantly sprang to her feet. China kicked out, catching her in the leg and knocking her back, then came up and tapped her forearms and flung them wide. Tanith dodged the wave of blue energy and got in close, her fist smacking against China's cheek. Tanith's hands blurred. A punch caught China in the ribs. She staggered back, gasping for breath, but managed to block the kick that followed. She tried to give herself some room, but Tanith was already closing in. China knocked her knuckles together, and the tattoos glowed briefly red. She swung a punch that missed, but the next one caught Tanith in the chest. Tanith went sprawling and slid across the ground. Valkyrie glimpsed the glowing symbol on China's right palm a moment before she seized Tanith's wrist. Tanith screamed in abject agony, kicking out by pure instinct. Her boot crunched into China's ribcage. China grunted and released her hold, and Tanith scrambled up and charged. She went low, her shoulder against China's stomach, while her arms wrapped around her legs. She lifted China and then slammed her to the ground, falling on top of her. With her left arm, China held Tanith close, not giving her the room she'd need to throw damaging attacks. Tanith was concentrating on keeping China's right hand with that glowing symbol away from her. Feeling returned to Valkyrie's legs, and she started to get up. Her brain struggled to sort itself out. Tanith shoved China away, and they parted, coming up on their feet at the same time. Tanith was the first to strike, but China parried the blow and chopped at Tanith's bicep. Tanith backpedaled, her right arm hanging uselessly, and China stepped in quickly and caught her with a solid haymaker to the jaw. Tanith spun and fell to her knees. Sanguine leaped at China, wrapping an arm around her throat. They stumbled back, but instead of trying to break the choke, 
China's hand went to her belly. Blue energy crackled through her, throwing Sanguine off. He dropped to the pavement, and China turned her attention back to Tanith. She activated the symbols on both of her palms, then stepped up to clamp her hands on either side of Tanith's head. Tanith arched her back and screamed. Valkyrie pushed at the air, but her focus was off, and all she could do was stir up a breeze that played with China's hair. China looked at her and let go of Tanith, who collapsed beneath her. Valkyrie's legs gave out, and she fell. She saw a remnant flitting down towards Tanith, but China held out her hand. No, she commanded. Leave her. She annoys me. Take the scarred one. The remnant hovered as if reluctant, then darted for Ghastly. China turned back to Valkyrie. Come now, she said. Your disciples are waiting. Chapter 49 Following the Key Tanith raised her head and watched China and Ghastly drive off in the van, taking Valkyrie with them. Tanith's head was buzzing, and every joint was sore. Is someone gonna help me up? Sanguine asked as he lay spread-eagled on the pavement. Tanith ignored him. Skullduggery came over, pulled her to her feet, and a wave of dizziness overtook her. She stumbled back against a lamppost. They have... Val, she muttered, waiting for the world to stop spinning. Why didn't China just kill her? Why do they want to keep her alive? Valkyrie is darkest, Skullduggery said. What? It's a long story, one that we're going to help her make sure never comes true. Our only chance is the receptacle. Are you okay? Can you fight? Always. Tanith pushed herself away from the wall, managing to stand by herself. But China has the key. Can you activate the machine without it? Hello, said Sanguine. Anyone hear me? According to Gordon, we need the key, Skullduggery said. We have to get it back. So, we fight our way through all the possessed to China, and then fight our way back to the receptacle. I like a good scrap as much as the next girl, Skullduggery, but we'd never make it. We need another plan. We don't have another plan. The remnants are in place right now. We don't have time to mess about trying to hotwire a machine that none of us have ever seen before. Sanguine grunted. <clears throat> Fine. Don't help me up. See if I care. I'll just lie here and freeze to death. Tanith spun to him. Will you shut up? Sanguine smiled. You are finally succumbing to my charms, ain't you? Unless you have something constructive to add, Skullduggery said, anger biting the edges of his words, then I agree with Tanith. Shut up. Oh, but I do have something constructive to add. Sword Lady, help me up now and I'll solve all your problems and woes. I swear on my dear dead mama, may she rest in pieces. Tanith stalked over to him, grabbed his outstretched hand, and twisted his wrist until he leaped up, howling. There, she said. Happy? The Texan scowled at her. We got to work on our communication skills, honey bunny. This constructive thing you were going to add to our conversation, Skullduggery said. Now would be a good time to share it. There was a sound, like a car backfiring in the distance. Sanguine frowned and his hand went to his shoulder. When he took it away, it was covered in blood. Hey, he said, surprised. I think I've been shot. Tanith looked past him and saw a man running towards them, his left arm in a sling, his right holding a gun. He was firing as he came. That guy shot me, Sanguine exclaimed. The man's aim wasn't improving, but the closer he got, the closer the bullets whined. Tanith ducked behind Skullduggery as he held up a hand, creating a solid wall of air. Sanguine took a deep breath, and the ground swallowed him. Remnant? Tanith asked. Dalrymple, Skullduggery replied. The man, Dalrymple, threw the gun away and took a sword from his belt, 
yelling a battle cry. A hand emerged from the ground, snagging his foot, and Dal Rimple sprawled onto the road. Sanguine rose up behind him, kicking the sword from his hand. Dal Rimple lunged, but Sanguine caught him with a knee to the gut, then grabbed his ear. Dal Rimple cried out, and Sanguine dragged him over to the pavement. He dumped him at Skullduggery's feet, then turned his full attention to clutching his injured shoulder. This really hurts, he muttered. I, I hope we're going to kill this guy. We, we are going to kill him, right? Please, Dalrymple sobbed. Let me close to them. I'm sorry I shot at you. You were just in my way. I thought you were going to stop me. Skullduggery turned his head, looking behind them. Tanith followed his gaze. The possessed would have been preparing to stop anyone from reaching the receptacle, so that probably meant that the place where they were gathered was directly outside the chamber. She looked at Skullduggery and knew he was thinking the same thing. Leave the weapons here, Skullduggery said. We won't stop you. Sanguine looked up. What? We'll let him go? This has nothing to do with you, Sanguine. I'm the one he shot. Dalrymple, go. Now. Dalrymple looked up, tears in his eyes, like he was waiting for Skullduggery to change his mind. When nothing more was said, he scrambled up and sprinted past them. I don't believe you guys, Sanguine said, shaking his head. I bet if he shot you, you wouldn't be nearly so forgiven. Tanith looked at him. How stupid are you? Sanguine looked offended. Not very. Think about it, moron. None of us know where the receptacle is, do we? None of us know where the remnants are. They could be anywhere. It's a big mountain range. It ain't that big. He's going to lead us right where we need to go. And you notice he's on foot? So he knows a shortcut. And we're going to follow him? Do you need me to explain it to you slower? Hey, enough with the attitude, okay? I've been shot, and my insides are still all twisted up, and I'm suffering from blood loss. But I ain't no moron. Fact is, both of you are the morons. You're planning on following him to the creepy critters and the machine that'll save us all, but you can't start it, can you? What are you planning on doing? Looking at it a while? Remarking on how pretty and shiny it is? Call that a plan? Do you have a better idea? Skullduggery asked. Course I do. I'm from Texas. We all got better ideas in Texas. My idea is to follow that fool who shot me, get into the cavern where the giant soul catcher is kept, and turn it the hell on using this key I picked from the pocket of Miss China Sorrows. Sanguine held up the golden key and tossed it to Skullduggery. Now tell me. What do y'all think of that particular plan? They kept a safe distance, but they needn't have bothered. Dalrymple was so intent on getting to his precious remnants that he didn't even glance back once. Sanguine spent most of the time complaining about his arm. He was chewing on a leaf to numb the pain, but it was obvious, just by looking at him, that he was getting weaker with every step. Halfway there, Skullduggery slowed down to help him traverse the rocky terrain. Sanguine was too tired to question the sudden change of heart, but Sanguine knew that Skullduggery must have one last job for him to do before he fell by the wayside. Hold on, Skullduggery said at last, as they watched Dalrymple disappear from sight. The golden key was glowing. He moved it around, and the glow strengthened. This way. Tanith, check on Dalrymple. He half carried Sanguine up an incline to their right, and Tanith jogged to where she had last seen Dalrymple. She crouched as she approached an outcrop and peered over it. Below her, in a wide open space of grasses and gorse bush, were two thousand possessed people. She saw Dalrymple running towards them, then ducked down before anyone saw her. Keeping low, she hurried back and rejoined Skullduggery, just as he sat sanguine down next to a sheer wall of rock. I'm feeling uh, distinctly woozy, Sanguine mumbled. It looks like they're all there, Sanguine told Skullduggery. And I mean all of them. There's an army down there. 
Is this the cabin? Where's the door? I think this is the door, Skullduggery replied. Notice how sharp the angles are on this section. See? Less weathered, less beaten down by the elements. So what? What does that mean? They're resistant to damage. And the door to the cavern would have to be very resistant to damage. Hey, she said, nudging Sanguine with her foot. Can you take us inside? Let him rest, Skullduggery told her. We're going to need him soon enough. I'm sure we can get in here by ourselves. So, how do we open it? Is there a magic word or something? I hope not. I'm assuming this key will activate the machine and open the door, but... But where's the keyhole? Indeed. He tapped the key against the rock wall. Nothing happened. She pressed her hand flat against it, the way she'd open any locked door. Still nothing. Are you sure this is the door? Tanith asked. I can't see any join or hinge or anything like that. How does it open? Does it swing or rise or sink or, or what? If we knew that, we could work our way back from there. Skullduggery examined the rock anew. It wouldn't be easy to open, but at the same time, it should be straightforward. Anyone who needs to access the receptacle ought to be able to do so once they have the key. So maybe it's a combination of both, Tanith said. A magic word spoken by whoever's holding the key. It's possible, but that doesn't exactly help us. Any one word in any language, magical or mortal, could unlock it. Well, you're the detective. You figure it out. Skullduggery sighed and considered the rock wall again. Open, he said loudly. A scale. A scale to a match. Enter. Melon. Open sesame. Remnant. Soul catcher. Receptacle. Danger. Wow, Tanith breathed. We could be here a while. Sanguine looked up from his seated position beside Skullduggery. There's something written on it, he said, slurring his words. The key. Uh, look. Skullduggery turned it over, and Tanith stepped up. But all she could see was flat gold. I can't see anything, she said. I can, Skullduggery murmured. He tilted the key till it caught the light. It's faint, but it's there. She peered closer. You're sure it's not just your imagination playing tricks? When my imagination plays tricks, Skullduggery answered, they're a lot more elaborate. I swear I can't see anything. That's because you're looking with your eyes, Sanguine said, his head drooping. Me and the skeleton, we ain't got eyes. It says, erode, Skullduggery said. Tanith looked at the rock wall. Nothing's happening. Skullduggery thought for a moment, then said, Cream, and the wall started to rumble. Tanith looked at him. It worked. It's working. What did you say? Cream, he repeated. It means erode in Irish. Relief swept through her, and she smiled, and the rock exploded into a cloud of dust that stung her eyes and got into her mouth. Tanith stumbled away, coughing and spluttering. The dust was in her hair and in her clothes. Her vision finally cleared, and she saw Skullduggery standing there in a dust-free air bubble. Oh, he said, noticing the state she was in. Sorry. The cloud parted for him as he walked through it. Tanith scowled and followed, helping Sanguine up and entering the newly formed cave mouth. Maybe you should put your arm around me, Sanguine said. I'm feeling faint. If you faint, you fall, Tanith responded. Torches flared in brackets as they passed. The tunnel went on for twenty meters, then opened out into a cavern. Skullduggery stood just ahead, waiting for them to catch up. Well? Tanith asked. Is it there? He didn't answer. He didn't have to. A globe, like a small glass moon, one hundred meters high and a hundred meters wide, sat in a cradle of metal and wooden struts, 
lashed together with rope and chains. The architects, the engineers, whoever had built this, had used the rocky outcrops to border the machine, to supply its foundation. The cavern itself seemed to be an extension of the massive device, designed to accentuate the size and shape, giving the receptacle an air of something that had always been here, a natural formation of magic and old science deep within the mountain. Cool, Tanith said. She left Sanguine leaning against the wall and joined Skullduggery as he hurried to what looked like a control centre. There were dials and gauges and levers, and a narrow, rectangular slot. Without wasting time on ceremony, Skullduggery slipped the key into the slot. Immediately a gauge came to life. Skullduggery grabbed a lever and pulled it down sharply. And nothing happened. Well, Tanith heard Sanguine say, that's kind of disappointing. No, Skullduggery said, look, it's moving. Tanith could see it now. The globe was beginning to rotate very, very slowly. It creaked as it did so. It hasn't been used in over a century, Skullduggery said. It needs some time to warm up. In order for the remnants to be dragged into it, we've got to make sure that the possessed stay close by. And just how, Sanguine asked, are you planning on doing that? Skullduggery looked at him, and his head tilted. Sanguine's mouth turned down. Oh, hell, he muttered. Chapter 50 McGillicuddy's Reeks Her surroundings were quite beautiful. A snow-covered mountain, layers of mist rising from the valleys, a pale blue sky. They had passed a lake on the way here, and the roads were narrow and winding occasionally edged with low stone walls. Altogether very pretty, with the effect only ruined by the two thousand black-veined people waiting for her when she was pulled out of the van. China marched her to a small hill in the middle of the clearing, all the remnants gathering round in their hijacked bodies. China removed the shackles from Valkyrie's wrists. Anton Shudder and Tesseract joined them on the hill. The crowd was silent. Valkyrie Kane, Tesseract said. I'm very glad I didn't kill you. What a mistake it would have been. I would have robbed you of our saviour. Let me go, Valkyrie said. If I'm your saviour, then do as I command. Let me go. You're not our saviour. Not yet. But with a little help from us, you soon will be. I don't know what you expect me to say. Do you think I'm just going to agree to all this? I'm not going to hurt innocent people. If we torture you enough, said Tesseract, you'll do anything we tell you. Valkyrie said nothing. I'm the one who saw you. I saw you through the eyes of Finbar Rong, laying waste to the world. That's all we want. We want a dead world, where we are free where we don't have to hide in flesh suits. You give us that world. From the moment I saw you, I knew we had to help, to guide you on your path. Now, I am not so sure I was right. So, you're going to let me go? There was a ripple of laughter in the crowd. No, Tesseract said. You see, we have been talking, all of us, and we wonder if we are taking the correct approach. It was China who thought of it, actually. China smiled. We're friends, aren't we, Valkyrie? That's what you said. And because we're friends, because I know you so well, I can see that it would take a lot to make you hurt the people you love. I'm not Darkus, Valkyrie blurted. I've changed all that. That future doesn't happen anymore. How can you be sure? asked China. I've sealed my name. Ah, I see. So you think the only reason you kill everyone is because someone is forcing you to? Yes? Of course. Why else would I do it? Because you want to, perhaps. Because something happens. 
something so awful that it drives you to the edge, and the only way out you can see is if everybody dies? That's insane. All kinds of people want to kill the world, Valkyrie. Not me. Not yet, China laughed. But I agree with you. I don't think you have it in you. So I came up with an alternative. What if, Valkyrie, what you say is true? What if you would never do this? What if, in fact, it isn't even you? What? I think Darkus is like us, you see. I think Darkus has a remnant inside her. Valkyrie shrank back. No. I think in order for our Messiah to come out, one of us is going to have to bond with you. No. And we already have a volunteer, China said with a smile. Fletcher appeared at China's side. I love you, he said to Valkyrie. And now I'm going to be you. Hands grabbed her and she struggled against them. But there were too many. Her head was pulled back and there were fingers in her mouth. She bit down and tasted blood, heard a howl of pain. But her jaws were forced apart and she saw it, the remnant, darting from Fletcher's mouth as he dropped to the ground, unconscious. The remnant latched onto her face and it was cold. The hands released her and Valkyrie staggered back, lost her footing. She fell, rolled down the small hill, all the while trying to pull the darkness away from her. She felt it slither down into her throat. Her hands clutched at her chest as the remnant dissipated within her. Tendrils of cold slithered through her body and pierced her brain. Something burst within her mind and the fear went away. And Darkes stood. The others were watching her expectantly, eyes filled with hope and hunger, mouths twisted in smiles. Ghastly was the first to step forward. My lady, he asked, voice shaking. When Ghastly had been Ghastly, before the remnant shared his being, he had been a good man. Darkus remembered their first meeting, when he had told her that magic wasn't a game, and that she should walk away and leave this behind her. He had said those words for her own good, but of course she hadn't listened. This was a path she had always been meant to walk. Destiny? She didn't believe in it. But she had seen into the future, and they had seen herself burn the world, and that she believed in. She took her eyes off the people around her and looked at the world. The mountains and the snow, the rocks and the sky. She tasted the air. Why would she want to destroy all this? What was it that could drive her to annihilate an entire planet? And what would she do, once everyone and everything was dead? Who would there be to talk to? Darkest smiled at the question she found herself asking. No doubt, when the time came, she would fully understand why she was killing everything. When the time came, she was sure it would all make perfect sense. Lady Darkes, someone said, barging through the crowd to throw himself at her feet. His left arm was in a sling. I am yours to command. You have given me purpose. You have given me a reason to exist. What is your will? He looked up at her, tears in his eyes. She kicked him under the chin, marvelling at her strength. His jaw splintered instantly, but her boot continued upwards and his head came apart around it. Some important piece of him, possibly his brain, shot into the sky like a football. His body crumpled and she laughed and turned to the others. The shock over what she had just done made some of them step back, but there were plenty of others who were laughing along with her, and there were a few who actually applauded. She despised them all. She leaped for the nearest one, a sorcerer she had once spoken to in the old sanctuary. Her fingers closed around his throat, and she tore out his windpipe. The woman beside him clapped, 
and Darkis put her fist through the woman's chest, then flung the body behind her. The laughter was dying. No one was cheering any more. Darkis swept through them, their screams like a lullaby, making her smile. As she moved, she could sense the remnant inside her. She could sense its presence and its confusion. This was not how it was meant to be. It had slithered its way inside and opened her up, allowed Darkis to surface. But they had not, as the remnant had expected, become one pure being. They were still two separate entities, and she felt its fear, and it brought a chuckle to her lips. Her soul was sealed. Nye had seen to that. It was hers, and hers alone. All the remnant had managed to do was break down some walls between Valkyrie Kane and the source of her magic. It may have tainted something along the way. Darkus couldn't be entirely sure. Not that it mattered. It was Darkus who was in control here. The remnant wanted to get out. It was trying to bring itself back together and crawl out of her, but Darkus wouldn't allow it. She kept it where it was, isolating it draining its malevolence to add to the magic that was pumping through her body. The sorcerers were attacking her now, trying to subdue her, trying to save themselves. She used the air to fling three of them upwards, then sent three spears of shadows after them. Hands seized her from behind, trying to choke her. She poured darkness through her skin into his, and the man shrieked and fell back, his hands melting away to stumps. A stream of energy sizzled to her, and she caught it in her palm, countered its effects without even knowing how she was doing it, and threw it back. The stream hit its owner, and its owner split apart in a fine red mist. She crushed the skull of a handsome man and tossed him away from her. His body spiralled over the angry crowd. Things were not going as they had planned. Darkes clicked her fingers, and flame enveloped her, her skin and hair and clothes all burned, fiercely and brightly, but the fire didn't damage her. People scrambled to get away. She held out a hand and fire leaped at them. They rolled and writhed and screamed. She laughed. A man tried to run. Tesseract caught him by the throat. You run from your savior, you ungrateful wretch. She's killing us, the man gasped. This is what we call warming up. Tesseract shoved him back. Darkes, please accept my apologies. Kill as many as you like. When you are ready to begin the decimation of the world, please know that we will be ready to serve, to help in any way. Darkes used the fire to kill the man who had run, then let the flame go out and stalk towards Tesseract, wondering how long he would stay faithful when she started pulling out his spine. But then the ground started to crack, and Skullduggery Pleasant and Tanith Low burst up in a shower of dirt and rock. Billy Ray Sanguine collapsed behind them and didn't move. Valkyrie, Skullduggery said. Stop this. Darkus looked at him, then looked at Tanith. Tanith looked scared and shocked and upset and worried. She held her sword like she was ready to use it on anyone who got close. Darkus could see her own reflection in the blade. A pretty girl with a scar in her cheek. Sixteen years old and dark-haired. Her pale face splattered with other people's blood. Her eyes dark-ringed. Is this what they all saw, she wondered? Or did they see something else? Something magnificent and terrible. Something monstrous. Valkyrie, Skullduggery said. She looked back at him. You're not yourself. Do you understand me? You're confused. You are Valkyrie Kane. You are not Darkes. You cannot change who she is, Tesseract said from behind him. Shut up, Skullduggery said, without looking around. Valkyrie, listen to my voice. I'm your friend. I'm your partner. I promised you I'd help you with this, and I intend to. You don't want this to happen. I know you don't. 
A man lunged at Tanith, and Darkis gestured, took his head off with a shadow. Val, Tanith said, her voice shaking. Please, it's me. It's us. You don't want to hurt anyone. Come back to us. I could kill you, Darkis said. She didn't have to talk loudly to be heard. I could reach out, take hold of your face, and squeeze. Turn your head to mush. In your last few seconds of life, what would you think of me? Would you still love me? What about you, Skullduggery? I could kill you just as easily. You're not going to kill me, Valkyrie. Valkyrie is gone. No, she's not, Skullduggery said. I'm talking to her. Darkest shook her head. You don't understand. I understand perfectly. Darkis isn't a separate entity. She isn't another person. She's you. If you make the wrong choices, if you stop loving the people who love you, if you allow the world to twist and turn and change you, then, yes, the future we've seen will come to pass. But if you fight, and if you kick and struggle, and refuse to give in to the apathy, or the anger, or the hopelessness, then you'll change the future, and you'll walk your own path. And I'll be right there beside you, Valkyrie. I'll always be beside you. She felt the remnant inside her, its anguish, and she grew tired of playing with it. It had come into her so eagerly, impatient to share her being and help her fulfill the fate that the psychics had foreseen. But now it understood that there would be no sharing. The remnant's presence was merely offering her a peek at what was to come. But she would get there on her own. She didn't need any help. It squirmed and fought and its screams filled her head, and when she was done enjoying it all, she flooded her body with heat and the heat burned away the cold that the remnant had brought. She purged it from her body, and purged it from her mind, and then it was gone. And with it, for the moment, went the bad thoughts and the emptiness. Valkyrie's legs folded beneath her, and Skullduggery darted forward to keep her from falling. Thanks, she mumbled as the crowd surged around her. No problem. Skullduggery said softly, then pressed his gun into her temple and said loudly, Any of you take even one more step, and Valkyrie dies. Chapter 51 The Receptacle The crowd froze. Tesseract stared. You're bluffing, he said. Try us. Tanith told him, her sword flashing to Valkyrie's throat, where it lay cold against her skin. You're not going to kill her, Tesseract said. Put the weapons down. Skullduggery thumbed back the hammer of his gun. Valkyrie would rather die, here and now, than allow another one of you to possess her and drive her to become the monster that kills the world. We'll be doing her a favor. She knows we would. Wreath came up beside Tesseract, smiling. Don't be ridiculous. She's your friend. She's your partner. She's an honest, decent, innocent girl, with her whole life ahead of her. You're not going to kill her in cold blood. Ghastly, Skullduggery called. Are you here? The crowd parted, and Ghastly made his way forward. You've known me a long time, Skullduggery said. Do you think I'd be willing to kill Valkyrie to save the world? Ghastly's fist clenched, and he looked at Tesseract. He'll do it, he said. I agree, said China, gliding easily through the throng of people. To be perfectly honest, I'm surprised he hasn't pulled the trigger already. Wreath's lip curled in a snarl. Then we'll take her from him. I don't like your chances, Skullduggery said. There are some among you who could probably take down either myself or Tanith before we could act. But both of us, you don't have a hope. We're giving you ten seconds to vacate the people you've possessed. I'm not going back to prison, Ghastly said. If you're going to kill Valkyrie, 
Then go ahead. We might not get our dead world, but anything is better than going back to that room. We're not telling you to, Tanith said. Vacate those people and leave. Neither side is going to win here today, so we're calling it a draw. Try your luck again tomorrow, and tomorrow we'll kick the hell out of you. You expect us to give you back these people? China asked. I think not. I rather like this body and this mind and all the magic that comes with them. Those of us who are inhabiting the forms of sorcerers are weapons now, said Tesseract. We're not going to relinquish these weapons so you can use them against us the next time we meet. I'm afraid you don't have a choice, Skullduggery said. Those ten seconds start now. Tesseract glared at him with hatred in his eyes, and then he looked at Valkyrie. Your friends are prepared to kill you, Darkus. They fear you, as well they should. Five seconds, Skullduggery said. This isn't over, Tesseract said. He pried his mask away from his face and opened his mouth wide, as all around him his companions did the same. The remnant squirmed out and flitted to the sky, and Tesseract collapsed, unconscious, the mask snapping back into place. All around Valkyrie, remnants crawled out of the mouths of their vessels to emerge as a cloud of writhing blackness that filled the air with angry shrieks. Valkyrie looked up at Skullduggery. The receptacle, she whispered. Don't worry, Val, Tanith said. We already found it. See that little cave over there? That's the entrance. And even as she spoke, the ground started to rumble. The remnants' movements grew erratic as the first of them felt the pull. Three of them suddenly whipped out of the cloud, yanked by an invisible hand to the mountain, their screeches turning from anger to terror. More followed, in greater numbers, forming a continuous stream of howling darkness. The remnant that had vacated Tesseract's body dived down, clinging onto the collar of the assassin's coat, fighting the pull. It dragged itself towards his masked face, stopping only when Skullduggery went to stand over it. The moment you inhabit that man, Skullduggery said, speaking loudly to be heard over the shrieking and the rumbling, I'll kill him and you'll be destroyed. Do you think I'm bluffing? Tanith lowered her sword from Valkyrie's neck and Valkyrie started to breathe again. The stream ended, disappearing into the mouth of the cavern. The remnant clinging defiantly onto Tesseract was the last one, and then it too let go. But instead of allowing itself to be pulled into the mountain, it veered off and lunged at Valkyrie. Tanith shoved her out of the way, and the remnant collided with her instead. Tanith went rolling down the embankment, and Valkyrie and Skullduggery leaped down after her. Tanith tried to pull the remnant from her, but it was no use. Her throat bulged, and she stopped gagging. Immediately, she spun onto her back, her boots striking Skullduggery's leg with a sharp crack of breaking bone. He yelled in pain, and Tanith was up and jumping, spinning in midair to deliver another kick to his ribs. Skullduggery stumbled and went down. Tanith reached for Valkyrie who stepped back and slapped the hand away, struggling to adjust to Tanith as an enemy. Tanith had no such qualms. Her elbow smacked into Valkyrie's jaw, and Valkyrie sprawled in the gorse brush. She got up and blocked a kick that drove her back, tried to respond with one of her own, but Tanith just laughed. The air rippled, and Tanith hurtled off her feet. Run! Skullduggery shouted as he tried to get up. Valkyrie sprinted for the cavern. The receptacle was still active. She could hear the rumble and feel the ground tremble beneath her boots. If she could lure Tanith into the cavern, the machine would rip the remnant out of her. But she didn't have much time. It was already slowing down. She glanced back to see Tanith flipping over Skullduggery's head, landing to scoop something off the ground. Skullduggery's gun. Valkyrie turned to run back. Tanith fired twice, and Skullduggery jerked stumbling on his bad leg. He went down, and Tanith threw the gun away, then looked up to grin at Valkyrie. Cursing, Valkyrie resumed her run to the cavern. Tanith was behind her, and gaining fast. 
and Valkyrie realised just how much her friend had been holding back during their time training together. Tanith was always stronger, faster and better, but she had never made it too obvious. There were occasions when Valkyrie had even fancied that they were becoming equals. Now, with the effortless way Tanith was closing the distance between them, Valkyrie could see what a self-deluding fool she'd been. She reached the cavern before Tanith caught up to her. The deep roar from the receptacle was almost deafening, dust falling from the rock ceiling. The orb in the machine was alive with swirling blackness. Valkyrie turned, panting, as Tanith staggered in behind her. The grin was gone, replaced with a strained determination. The remnant inside her must have been screaming in pain. Let her go, Valkyrie shouted. Tanith kept coming, lurching with each step. Valkyrie pushed at the air, just hard enough to hurt and maybe loosen the remnant's hold, but Tanith sprang, catching her by surprise. Valkyrie fell back, whipping the shadows to cover her retreat, but Tanith cartwheeled on one hand and ran to the wall, running up and disappearing behind a jagged outcrop. Valkyrie kept stepping back, searching for a place to stand that wouldn't leave her vulnerable. She saw movement out of the corner of her eye as Tanith dropped behind her, but she was too slow to do anything about it. Tanith wrapped an arm around her throat, going for a sleeper hold. Panic flashed in Valkyrie's mind. Her hands moved of their own accord, snapping flat against the air, the way she used to do at home to boost herself up to her window sill. This time, she shot backwards, hearing Tanith's surprised yell as they both went sprawling. She expected Tanith to already be on her feet by the time she looked up, but the effect of the machine was becoming more noticeable. Tanith's lips were black, and the veins were spreading as she dragged herself up off the ground. Valkyrie ran at her, intent on piling on the pressure until the remnant couldn't take it any more. Tanith blocked the first punch and dodged the second, but Valkyrie kicked at her shin and connected with a third. She followed it with a sidekick, shooting it out like Tanith herself had taught her. Tanith doubled over, and Valkyrie pulled her head down to meet her knee. Tanith snapped back on impact and staggered away, tripping over her own feet and falling in the dust. Leave her, Valkyrie demanded. Tanith laughed and spat blood. You're going to have to kill me, Val. Valkyrie went to move forward, but she could tell Tanith was trying to draw her in, Instead, she grasped the trail of shadows and flicked it. Tanith dived and rolled, the shadows missing her completely. She kicked out, sweeping Valkyrie's legs from under her. Valkyrie hit the ground, felt Tanith's hands on her, and then her jacket was yanked off. Tanith hauled her up and threw her against the wall. A fist flew at her face, and suns exploded before her eyes. Another one came in low, swooping into her side. Without the protection of her jacket, her lungs turned sharp and painful, and she knew a couple of ribs were broken. Her eyes were blurred with tears, and she couldn't see what she was doing, but she knew roughly where Tanith was, so she launched her head forward. She felt the impact and heard Tanith's howl of pain. She wiped her eyes, saw Tanith holding her nose. She shuffled forward with a kick that would have felt anyone without Tanith's abdominal muscles. As it was, all the kick did was to give her a little more room. Tanith grimaced suddenly and gasped, and for a moment the veins went away, and Valkyrie knew it was her friend looking at her through tortured eyes. Then the eyes turned narrow as the remnant regained control. Valkyrie stepped up with a punch that jarred her whole body and sent Tanith to the ground. Fight it, she screamed. Tanith, fight it. Tanith rolled over. She tried to get up, then collapsed. Force it out of you, Valkyrie called. Do it, now. The receptacle was starting to slow down. They only had a few more seconds before it deactivated. Valkyrie grabbed Tanith's ankles, started dragging her closer to the spinning orb. Tanith kicked and struggled, but she was weakening. Valkyrie dropped the ankles and bent over her, slipping her hands under Tanith's arms and pulling her up. Grunting with the effort, 
she shoved Tanith the last few meters to the machine. Tanith grabbed on to an outcrop to keep herself upright and stood there, gasping. It's over, Valkyrie said. She didn't have to shout any more because the rumbling was dying down. Please, leave Tanith alone. You've lost, okay? You're not going to win this, so please leave her. Rejoin the others. Now, why, Tanith managed to say, would I want to do that? Because you've lost. No, Val, I'll only have lost if I get stuck back in that room. Valkyrie stalked up. Tanith raised a hand to stop her, but Valkyrie pushed it down, and her fingers closed around Tanith's throat. If I have to choke you out of there, I will. Tanith's black lips parted in a weak laugh that Valkyrie cut off by squeezing. The rumbling was now nothing but a low, rhythmic throb. The orb was spinning on nothing but its own momentum, and that was slowing with every turn. Valkyrie squeezed tighter, and Tanith's free hand tapped uselessly at her. Get out of there, Valkyrie screamed. The orb stopped spinning, and the rumbling stopped, and the receptacle deactivated. No, Valkyrie whispered. Tanith smiled, grabbed Valkyrie's t-shirt, and pulled her closer, and her elbow cracked against Valkyrie's head. The next thing Valkyrie was aware of was a gunshot. She was on the ground. She couldn't remember falling. And she was watching Tanith run up a wall of rock and vanish into the darkness. Skullduggery limped over, keeping his gun hand trained on where Tanith had last been. Are you okay? he asked. No, Valkyrie whispered. Chapter 52 New Year's Eve Ireland was under quarantine. All flights in and out of the country cancelled. There were no boats or ferries. Not even the fishermen could leave port. Europe was on high alert, even now that a cure had been found for the so-called insanity virus. The scientists had a technical name for it, but because they didn't have a clue how it started, no one bothered with them. A small group of researchers had stumbled onto the cure, and they were getting all the attention and all the praise. They had saved the country from a bizarre and mysterious new pathogen, which had baffled experts from around the world. The virus had struck, receded, and was now eradicated. Some thought it had been a terrorist attack. Others blamed secret government experiments, which drew much mirth from government representatives. People had been hurt, property had been damaged, and memories had been wiped. The number of dead, it was reported, was much lower than it could have been, for which everyone should have been thankful. But there would be no big parties or celebrations this New Year's Eve. After the last few days, it seemed like the whole of Ireland just wanted to lay low. Valkyrie wasn't feeling especially thankful either. It was still freezing cold, still harsh and unforgiving, and Roarhaven was the last place she wanted to be tonight. She wanted to be back at home, where she'd been spending most of the last few days, keeping an eye on her parents. Skullduggery had arranged for a squad of cleavers to provide protection, in case Tanith decided to pay Haggard a visit. But Valkyrie was still worried, and in no mood to watch other people play politics. Roarhaven's sanctuary was a mass of corridors that spiralled inwards to its centre. It was smaller than the old sanctuary in Dublin, and less concerned with charm or, indeed, heat. Heavy doors led off into rooms of varying sizes and functions. Many of the corridors were swamped in darkness, and others too dimly lit to be of any real use. They arrived at the centre room. Skullduggery pushed the doors open, and Valkyrie and Ghastly entered after him. Ravel nodded to them, but didn't break off his conversation with Geoffrey Scrutinus and Philomena Random. Valkyrie saw many people she recognised from the first meeting before Christmas. They were quiet and looked tired. 
the necromancers stood off to one side, talking among themselves. To their right, the torment stood alone. The mood was somber. Eyes were cast down. Gazes were not met. The atmosphere hung heavy with shame and regret and guilt. Carival Deuce was one of the dead. Who had killed him was unknown, and virtually impossible to establish. But it had sent all their plans and schemes into a spiral. Valkyrie hadn't known him for long, but she recognized the loss as much as anyone. He had been their great hope, a leader strong enough to convince the international community that Ireland could stand on its own, without interference from others. And now that hope was gone. Gradually the conversation died down. Ravel cleared his throat. I suppose we should start then. Welcome all of you. We've been through a lot in the last week, and I am immensely glad to see many of you here tonight. We have lost friends and family. We have seen the whole country plunged into a nightmare we can only hope it will recover from. But of course, we don't have the luxury of time in which to lick our wounds and grieve for the departed. We have a state of emergency. According to a trusted source in the German sanctuary, in those few days when we were compromised, the international community, headed by the American Council, was about to swoop in and save the day. While it could be seen as reassuring to have such good friends around the world, the unfortunate fact of the matter is that if they did swoop in, they would never swoop out again. Which means we need to consolidate our power as soon as possible, Scrutinus said. And that means choosing a new council of elders. A vote, said Chakra. No, tonight. We need to show them we're strong and decisive in the wake of what happened. Erskine, Skullduggery said. I think the obvious thing would be to have you as the Grand Mage. Ravel frowned. What? I agree with Skullduggery, Ghastly said. You know how the game works. In fact, I'd say the Internationals would actually find you better to work with than Caraval. You were his right-hand man for years. You share some of his views, but you aren't nearly as extreme. Ravel rubbed his forehead wearily. And does it matter at all that I have absolutely no interest at all in doing this job? Not really, Skullduggery said. Desperate times, desperate measures. A vote, said Scrutinus. All those in favour. Eyes filled the room. Ravel sighed. <sighs> Fine. And in that spirit of desperation, Skullduggery can be my first elder. Skullduggery shook his head. Not a chance. And how come you get to pass on the job offer, and I don't? Because I'm me. I have a suggestion, said the torment. Everyone looked at him. We have already given you the Raw Haven facility to use as your new sanctuary, which you have gratefully accepted. However, some of the citizens of our fair town have voiced misgivings. They feel that our goodwill has been taken advantage of. Go on, Ravel said, suspicion in his voice. It is our opinion that the Council of Elders should be comprised of three mages of firmly different sensibilities. For too long, the members of the Council have all thought the same way, held the same view, and clung on to the same prejudices. If Erskine Ravel is indeed elected Grand Mage, it is my feeling that the first of his elders should be Madame Mist. Ravel actually recoiled at the suggestion. But Madame Mist is a child of the spider. As am I, the torment said. You would dismiss us all because of this? No, of course not. It's just children of the spider have always been reclusive, even more so than the necromancers. The torment nodded like a wise old man. And it is time we changed our ways. Madame Mist would not only be a representative of the people of Rawhaven, and you would need their support for this sanctuary to succeed, 
but she would also be a voice for the few and the marginalized. Everyone gets heard in the sanctuary, Ravel countered. And Madame Mist will ensure that valued tradition continues, the torment said. Unfortunately, this is not open to discussion. If our request is denied, we will be forced to withdraw all assistance, this very building included. You're holding us to ransom, Flaring said. There's no way we'd ever agree to that. Excuse us for a moment, Skullduggery said, drawing stares from everyone in the room. He walked to the side, followed by Ravel and Ghastly and Valkyrie. You can't be serious, Ravel whispered. You can't seriously expect me to work beside Mist. It's what they've been planning all along, Skullduggery replied. When they offered us this building, we knew there was going to be a hitch. Mist is more than a hitch, said Ravel. Your council is going to need her in order to survive here. If they plan this, Valkyrie said, then we're just going along with their plan. How is that a good idea? This is the torment we're talking about. Skullduggery shook his head. Their plan was for Miss to be an elder alongside Erskine, with Corival as Grand Mage. But that isn't the case any more. Now Erskine is the Grand Mage, and so, whatever schemes they come up with, are going to have to change. Then we need another elder who's on our side, Ghastly said, to make sure Mist is kept in line. Yes, we do, Skullduggery nodded. Which is why it should be you. Ghastly's eyes widened. Have you lost your mind? Why not? You're liked, you're well-respected, and everyone knows about your bravery on the battlefield. This could be your chance to make a real difference. I'm not a politician, Ghastly said. I'm a tailor. You can still make my suits in your spare time, but we're really going to need you to do this. Ravel nodded solemnly. Destiny is calling, my friend. That's not destiny. That's you. And if it's bravery on the battlefield you're after, why not ask Anton or Vex or any one of the dead men? There were many more than just you, me and Skullduggery in our little group, if you remember. Anton Shudder scares people, and Dexter Vex is halfway around the world, living the life of an adventurer. Ghastly, think about what this will mean, Skullduggery said. As Elder... You could track down Tanith, capture her without harming her, and authorize a team of experts to figure out how to get rid of the remnant inside her. Who else is going to take the time to do that? Who else is going to care enough? Ghastly closed his eyes. Fine. Well, the torment asked as they rejoined the others. Have you reached a decision? Yes, I have, Ravel said. I will need to meet with Madame Mist to discuss a wide range of matters, but it would be an honour to have her beside me, providing no one has any objection to my own nominee. Ghastly bespoke. No? No objections? Excellent. In that case, we have a new council of elders. I think applause is due. They started to clap, and Valkyrie joined in. She waited until they were on their way out, when she was alone with Skullduggery, but before speaking again. Is it possible, she asked, to help Tanith? No, he said. From what we know of remnants, it's permanently bonded to her. There's no helping her, not any more. So you lied to Ghastly? Ghastly knows, Skullduggery said, his voice sad. He just doesn't want to believe it. Fletcher was waiting outside. When Skullduggery left them, Fletcher gave Valkyrie a pair of sunglasses. She frowned. Where are we going? Australia. He smiled and took her hand. In an instant they were standing in a park on a sunny Sydney morning, obscenely bright despite the sunglasses, and the heat hit her like a fist. Whoa! She breathed. She turned, saw couples and families strolling in the sun. She saw the edge of the opera house, half hidden by tall trees, 
and she turned again and saw the city. Thought you might appreciate the change, Fletcher said, slipping on his own pair of sunglasses. Valkyrie took off her jacket and sat on the grass, then lay back, smiling broadly despite everything that had happened. I should get you to bring me places like this more often, she said. Pack a pair of shorts, a bikini, I'd be set. Fletcher sat down beside her. And how do you explain a tan to your folks in the middle of winter? Oh, I'm sure I'd find a way. So why don't you? he asked. Why don't I what? Get me to take you places like this more often. I don't know. I should. I suppose I'm always busy. <laughs> well, he said with a laugh, it's either that or you'd rather spend your time with skullduggery than me. You know that's not true. Really? It's partly true, she admitted. Fletcher nodded. I don't blame you, actually. He didn't try to hurt you like I did. Her smile dropped. That wasn't your fault. It still happened. And you can't remember any of it. Does that mean I don't get to feel guilty? We all feel guilty, Fletch. He looked at her, and she looked away. To her right, a bright green bird, some kind of parrot, was feasting on a discarded sandwich. Valkyrie watched it until it had eaten its fill, and then it hopped closer. She stayed very still. The bird hopped onto her folded jacket. It was so close, she could sit up and touch it. But she didn't move. Fletcher looked at the bird and smiled. Ah, <sighs> this is what I love about Australia. If we were in Dublin or London, this would be a dull old pigeon, and we'd be shooing it away. But here, everything's brighter, more colourful, more fun. I should take you down to the Gold Coast, take you surfing. Wait till I'm better at manipulating water, Valkyrie replied. Then I'll surf. But that takes the fun out of it. The bird hopped onto her leg, and she laughed. It travelled north and stood on her belly, its head twitching as it surveyed its surroundings. Fletcher grinned. You've made a friend. It's waiting for me to give it some food. I haven't got any food, Birdie. Look, it's completely ignoring me. If it perches on my face, I swear to God... Give me a smile, Fletcher said, moving his phone up slowly. He took three pictures, and on the third, the parrot, or cockatoo, or whatever it was, looked around, and Fletcher nodded. That's a good one, he said. That's one you can never show your family. The bird flapped its wings. Valkyrie yelped and turned her face to the side as it lifted off, and when she looked back, it was sitting on Fletcher's head. She burst out laughing and rolled away, fumbling with her own phone before the opportunity was gone. Laughing so much, her hand was shaking, she took a half a dozen pictures of an increasingly horrified Fletcher. Please don't poo, he muttered. The bird flapped its wings and he yelled as it leaped from his head and dropped down onto the other side of him. Immediately, his hands went to his hair, fixing and straightening where the bird had flattened. Then he lunged, trying to grab the phone from Valkyrie's hand, but she held on to it and curled up into a ball, laughing too hard to form words. Finally, he gave up and lay back. Please don't show that picture to anyone, he said. She slipped the phone into her pocket and lay against him. No promises. Fletcher put his arm round her. Oh, we should do this more often. You need a break, Val, a holiday. When was the last time you had a holiday? I bet it was years ago, wasn't it? You need a week away from everything. A week where people aren't trying to kill you. Where you're warm and happy and safe. She kissed his cheek. You're always looking out for me, aren't you? That's why I love you. She felt his body stiffen. You love me? Her smile faded. Pretend I didn't say that. Fletcher sat up to look at her, but she closed her eyes. It's a beautiful day, and it was a nice moment. Don't spoil it. Okay, he said. He hesitated, then lay back down. Sure. They lay there, on the grass, in the sun. So, when do you want to go back? 
Let's give it half an hour, she said. I'm just getting warm. They stayed an hour, and then teleported back to Ireland. The cold came in at Valkyrie from all sides, and she groaned as she handed Fletcher back the sunglasses. She called Skullduggery to pick her up, and as the sun went down, they arrived at the Necromancer Temple. Chapter 53 Tenebrae Melancholia led them to the high priest's private meeting room. She looked tired and thin, and didn't even take time to glare at Valkyrie like she usually did. The high priest will be with you shortly, she mumbled. She swayed slightly, like she might faint, but regained her composure and left them in the room. She looks sick, Valkyrie said. Skullduggery nodded, but didn't comment. The meeting room was a circular chamber with a domed ceiling lit by dozens of candles. Valkyrie sat at the round table and waited. Fifteen minutes later, High Priest Tenebrae walked in, and she stood. She was so used to seeing him flanked by Craven and Quiver that meeting him alone was a little jarring. It was like he'd turned up without his clothes on. Detective Pleasant, Tenebrae said. Miss Kane, what can I do for you? We're all very busy here, dealing with the fallout from the remnants' attack. You weren't at the sanctuary meeting, Skullduggery said. I felt my time was better spent in an environment where I wasn't despised. From what I hear, however, you all seem to have managed without me. Ravel and Bespoke and Mist. Strange bedfellows. But I must ask why you are here. I am, as I have said, very busy. Skullduggery's lunge was so sudden that Valkyrie jumped back in shock. He shoved Tenebrae against the wall. Flustered, the high priest tried to break the hold. What the hell do you think you're doing? Skullduggery pointed his gun into Tenebrae's face. Where's the remnant? Tenebrae froze. The remnants are trapped. You said so yourself. I mean, your remnant. The one you had trapped in your own little soul catcher. The one who inhabited Ken Speckle Grouse, who tortured Tanith Lowe. Where is that remnant? I... I assume it's with all the others? Five months ago, Solomon Wreath took possession of the soul catcher with that particular remnant inside. We were assured it would be returned to the Midnight Hotel. Anton Shudder said that never happened. There's obviously been a mistake. Finbar Rong can't remember much, but he can remember Wreath turning up with the Soul Catcher a few days before all this started. You're saying Wreath released the Remnant on purpose? To what end? To inhabit this Finbar Rong person? Skullduggery stepped closer. I'm saying you ordered him to. Preposterous. This man is a sensitive, isn't he? Why would I order such a thing? Maybe because you wanted a glimpse into the future. In which case, said Tenebrae, I could have merely paid a sensitive to do so. Not if there was something in that future you wanted kept secret. Detective Pleasant, you are accusing me without one single shred of proof that I had anything to do with this. Where's Wreath? Skullduggery asked. I'm afraid I don't know. He's in hiding? I told you, I don't know. We haven't seen him since the remnant attack. I fear he may have been killed. Which would be very convenient for you. Quite the contrary. If Cleric Wreath were here, I'm sure he could explain why he didn't return the remnant to the Midnight Hotel, as per my instructions. I neither like nor appreciate being accused of something I did not do. And if you're going to shoot me, then shoot me. Otherwise, put down the gun and stop this ridiculous posturing. I should shoot you. I should kill you. Cold-blooded murder? In front of your protégé? It wouldn't be murder. It would be a justifiable execution. Tenebrae's eyes flickered to Valkyrie. And are you prepared to let him? If he kills me, it all changes for you. 
You'll be banished from the necromancer order. You'll never be able to fulfill your destiny. You'll never become the Deathbringer. Skullduggery smacked the gun against Tenebrae's head. Stop calling her that. Why? Tenebrae snarled, his hand rising to his forehead. Because you don't want to hear it? Because it offends your delicate sensibilities? If she is who Clerigry thinks she is, she has a chance to save the world. From what, exactly? You've never been too clear on the threat, have you? What does the Deathbringer save us from? Blood was trickling through Tenebrae's fingers. These are matters I will not speak about to outsiders. Then you'll tell Valkyrie? When she's ready to hear it. And when will that be? When it's too late for her to turn back? Detective Pleasant, are you worried that Valkyrie will slip from your influence? I would never have guessed you'd be so insecure. This has nothing to do with me. Which presumably means that this is all to do with her. Am I correct? And yet you haven't once allowed her to speak for herself this entire conversation. I enjoy listening, Valkyrie said. Tenebrae's smile was not particularly good-humoured. You're not usually so shy, Valkyrie. When you're on your own, you talk an extraordinary amount, don't you? You have opinions on everything, but when Detective Pleasant is here, you seem content to let him do all the talking for you. Have you noticed this? Can't say I have, Valkyrie said. But now that I've pointed it out, I assure you that you're going to— He's afraid, you see. He's terrified that you'll turn out to be the next Lord Vile. Isn't that true, detective? Skullduggery's voice lowered. Valkyrie's path is her own. And if she does, in fact, turn out to be the next Lord Vile, what then? Will you still be so philosophical? Or will you hunt her down and kill her? If it comes to that, Skullduggery said, putting his gun away, you'll be dead long before you get to see if you're right. Tenebrae took his hand away from his forehead and looked at the blood. Just so you know, I will be making a formal complaint about you to the sanctuary. Not that they'll take any notice. Two of your best friends on the Council of Elders, Detective. This couldn't have worked out better for you if you'd planned the whole thing. The mood in the car on the drive back was sombre. What are you thinking about? Skullduggery asked. She shook her head. I don't know. Everything. My thoughts can't seem to settle. Too much to think about. Have you heard anything about Clarabel? No, he said. No, I haven't. We shouldn't have allowed her to return to the Hibernian alone. We should have realized she'd find Ken Speckle's body. Valkyrie, we were organizing the teleportation of two thousand people, most of whom were still unconscious. We didn't have time to consider each and every one of them. We let her go, Skullduggery. We didn't even think about what she'd find. Do you think she's figured out what she did? She won't remember it, but... He sighed. <sighs> the evidence is there. We made a mistake. And now Clarabel has run off. If she wants to be alone, we should respect that. She's lost someone who meant the world to her. She needs time to grieve. How are you coping? Ah, uh, I'm grand. Have you mourned? Fight now, mourn later. Like you said, that's our thing. And now is the time to mourn. I don't know. I don't know how to feel or how to... to process it, you know. Ken Speckle reminded me of my granddad. Grumpy and grouchy and not approving of the people I hung out with. I felt safe with him. Every time he was around, I knew that whatever happened, he could fix me. He'd shuffle in, complain, make me feel guilty about getting into another fight. Then he'd insult you, make me laugh and fix me. And right before he left, he'd say something really nice to make sure I'd know he cared. You're going to miss him. She looked out of the window. Please don't make me cry. Of course, Skullduggery said. I'm sorry. She didn't say anything, and they drove on in silence until another name drifted, unwelcome, into her thoughts. Scapegrace, she muttered. 
Skullduggery turned his head to her. What about him? He's still locked in Ken Speckle's examination room. They both are. And? Well, we should probably let them out. So they can make more trouble for us? We just can't leave them there. They're looking for a cure. And Ken Speckle said it might be possible. We ought to let them out so they can find someone else to help them. Like who? How about Nye? This would be right up his alley. We don't want anything to do with Dr. Nye. And we won't have anything to do with him. We'll give them his name. Let them find him. We can't leave them locked up in that room, Skullduggery. You know we can't. Just stop by the Hibernian. It'll be two minutes. He grumbled about it a little more, but fifteen minutes later, Valkyrie was hurrying from the Bentley into the Hibernian. The place was a mess. The walls were scorched and rubble littered the walkways. The screen was off, but a hole had been blown through the wall, and she climbed in. Lights flickered in the corridors. Her footsteps were loud. Suddenly, coming in alone didn't seem like such a great idea. What if a remnant had stayed behind? She reached the examination room, but the transparent door stood open. They said they... Valkyrie shrieked and leaped away, spinning in midair to face her attacker. She landed and stumbled, and all the while Caelan watched her with a raised eyebrow. My God, she gasped. Don't do that. Don't do what? Don't sneak up on me. I wasn't sneaking. You nearly gave me a heart attack. I wasn't sneaking. I was walking. You should wear a bell round your neck. Are you finished hyperventilating? No, Valkyrie shouted, and then felt stupid. What? What do you want? I was just going to say, before you started screaming, that I released them. The two zombies. They said they were friends of yours. They said that. I suspect they may have been lying, but the taller one would not shut up, so I opened the door and asked them to leave me alone. I hope you don't mind. She forced herself to calm down. No, no, I don't mind. I came to let them out anyway, so... The crisis is over, I take it. Yes, you didn't hear the details? I'm a vampire without a pack. Nobody tells me anything. Ah, said Valkyrie. Right, yes, the crisis is over, and now that, you know, you're here, I suppose I should thank you for arriving when you did. You were in danger. I had to save you. She nodded and smiled. Out of gratitude, she knew she should have just let that one go. But then she found herself saying, Well, thank you for helping me. Saving me is a bit strong. Have you seen him since? The boy. You mean Fletcher? Yes, of course I have. Even after everything he did? That wasn't him. That was the remnant. If what happened to him had happened to me, I would never have hurt you. It couldn't happen to you, Valkyrie said. You're a vampire. Remnants can't possess the dead. Is that how you see me? As a dead thing? No, she admitted. How do you see me? As a friend. Nothing more? He touched her arm, and she smiled, but moved away. Caelan, I don't want you to think that this is going somewhere. You've been a really good friend to me. You've really come through, but I am firmly and absolutely with Fletcher. And even if I wasn't, I still don't think it'd be a good idea. Love is rarely a good idea. You don't love me. Yes, I do. Please, stop saying that. What will it take for you to love me? I can't love a vampire. Because we're monsters. Because when the sun goes down, we change. You realize, of course, that the sun went down a few hours ago. Valkyrie's eyes widened, and she immediately backed away. What are you doing? Don't worry, he smiled. I'm not going to change. He took a syringe from his pocket. Dusk used this, remember? It's a mixture of wolfsbane and hemlock and various other herbs. 
He'd inject it a few times a night, and it'd stop him changing. I've spent the last few days searching for it. The old man had manufactured more, dozens of vials of it, for whatever reason. Ken Speckle hated vampires, Valkyrie said softly. I took every last one of the vials. I didn't think he'd mind, now that he's dead. I read his notes, too, so I know how to make my own. Kalen's eyes closed. I can feel it. It wants to get out. It doesn't understand why it can't. He looked at Valkyrie. I don't have to be the monster. For you, for you, I can be normal. I can be human. If this is how you're going to live, you have to do it for yourself, not for me. He smiled again. You're my reward. No, Kalen, I'm not. Not yet, maybe. I have to prove myself. I'm willing to do that. Listen, said Valkyrie. I'm trying to be as clear about this as I possibly can. I don't want to be with you. I can hear how fast your heart beats every time you look at me. Well, she muttered, that's hardly fair. You're a strange girl, Valkyrie Kane. And I've got a skeleton detective waiting for me outside. You'd better get back to him then. I'll see you soon. Valkyrie thought he might step closer, try to kiss her, but instead he just smiled. She walked away and tried to ignore the fact that she was disappointed. She didn't tell Skullduggery about Kalen. She got in the Bentley, told him the zombies had already escaped, and they drove back to Haggard. It's not over, said Valkyrie. What isn't? This whole darkest business. I didn't stop it, did I? Skullduggery hesitated. It doesn't look like it, no. No one else remembers what they did when they were possessed, but I do. I remember more and more, all the time. The remnant wasn't controlling me, it just opened a door. Those people who died, I did that. She took a breath and let it out slowly. Don't worry, I'm not going to start crying or anything. If I had been in control, it wouldn't have happened. Obviously, I wasn't in control. I'm glad you realize that. But now we have proof, right? That there is something in me capable of doing everything we saw in that vision. So, what are we going to do about it? What do you suggest? Valkyrie looked straight ahead at the road. You could kill me. I have no intention of killing you, Valkyrie. Something turns you. Something triggers the change from the Valkyrie Cain we all know and tolerate to Darkus, evil witch queen of Dublin. It's going to be something tragic, isn't it? She said. Something awful happens to me or, or someone I love and I go nuts and seek revenge on the whole world. And that's a possibility. Any idea what this awful, tragic event might be? I don't know. But whatever it is, I'll be looking out for it. And so will you. When it comes, we'll be ready. He dropped her off at the pier and she gave him a wave and watched him drive away. She took out her phone as she hurried to her house, making sure the reflection was still out at a neighbor's party. According to the message it had left her, it was standing in the corner, not talking to anyone. The party itself was a complete flop, with no one being in the mood to make merry. Valkyrie, however, managed to smile at the thought of walking through her own front door for once, and letting the reflection be the one to climb up to the window. She felt bad about the cleavers, forced to keep watch out here in the freezing cold. Their van was parked on the far side of the road, with the engine off, so as not to arouse suspicion. She had never engaged a cleaver in conversation, had never even heard one speak, not really, but she approached the van anyway. She could sneak them out a couple of coffees if they needed warming up, and possibly give them some straws so they wouldn't even have to take their helmets off, she didn't know if they even drank coffee. She doubted it. The front of the van was empty, 
so Valkyrie rapped lightly on the side door. The windows were darkened. When there was no sound from inside, she frowned. There were three cleavers stationed here. One stayed with the van at all times, and the other two took regular patrols around the area. She gripped the handle. To her surprise, it wasn't locked. She slid the door open. Three cleavers lay dead inside. She turned and ran to her house. She slipped on the road and fell, rolled, lunged up and kept running. She jumped the low wall around her front garden, landing in the shadows, staying out of the light that shone from the living room window. The fire was roaring and the TV was on. Valkyrie saw her mum and dad chatting, and her knees went weak with relief. But they were talking to someone, a woman in jeans and a heavy sweatshirt. Valkyrie didn't recognize her until she turned her head to laugh. Valkyrie ran into the house and burst through into the living room. They all looked round, surprised at the dramatic entrance. Hi, Stephanie, Tanith said. Chapter 54 Enemies Heat, Valkyrie's mum said. Heat! Her dad got up, hurried out into the hall. She heard him close the front door to stop the draft, but couldn't take her eyes off Tanith. What are you doing here? Uh, my car broke down, Tanith smiled. I remember you said you lived here, so I thought I'd stay somewhere warm until my lift arrived. <laughs> Are you okay? You look like you're in shock. Her dad came back in. Born in a barn, were you? I swear to you, Tanith, I don't know where she gets it from. Tanith laughed. <laughs> don't worry, Des. She's exactly the same in school. I may only be a substitute teacher but I've been around long enough to know that Stephanie swans in and out of class, expecting doors to close all by themselves. They all chuckled, except for Valkyrie. Tanith, Valkyrie's mum said, were you caught up in this insanity virus thing? Wasn't it awful? Oh, Melissa, it was. My neighbour got it, actually. He went nuts. Didn't hurt anyone, thank God, but it was just so scary, just like the reports on TV. He's fine now, though. It was an attack, Valkyrie's dad said. Something like this just doesn't happen in nature. I bet that whoever did this was using Ireland as a testing ground. It'll be America next. You wait and see. Or London. His mum shook her head. Some people are saying now it was hallucinogenic drugs pumped into the water supply. They're even saying it started out as a prank. A prank! I'm sure you're right, Tanith said, nodding. But it was terrifying. I stayed home the entire time. There was no way I was setting foot outside. Wise woman. Oh, um, excuse me, Tanith said, taking out her phone and reading the screen. My lift is here. Oh, that was quick. That's the good thing about boyfriends. They come when you call. I'm not too sure how to get back to my car, though. It was on one of these roads. Oh, I'm sure Steph won't mind walking you back. No problem, Valkyrie said. You ready to go now? Let's go now. Tanith stood up and smiled again. So eager to get a teacher out of her house. Des, Melissa, thank you so much for your hospitality. Hopefully I'll see you at the next parent-teacher meeting. While her parents said their goodbyes, Valkyrie ushered Tanith out of the house. If you're going to set me on fire, Tanith said quietly, you might want to wait until we're around the corner. Valkyrie glanced back. Her dad was on the front step, watching them go. After another few moments of letting the heat out, he closed the door. Immediately, she stepped away from Tanith. Why are you here? Tanith kept walking, forcing Valkyrie to keep up. We're friends, Val. I just wanted to drop in, say hi. Ghastly's an elder. He's getting everyone to figure out a way to help you. She smiled. Why would you think I need help? Look at me. Don't I seem happy to you? You're a remnant. 
They were around the corner now, out of sight, and heading down to the pier. And we remnants are happy creatures, Tanith said. So Ghastly's an elder, is he? Well, I'm glad. I wouldn't have liked to see him spend the rest of his life in that little shop, never making any new friends. Maybe now he'll meet a nice girl, settle down. He loves you. He is a sweetheart. Valkyrie stopped walking. What do you want, Tanith? Tanith turned to her. I'm here to tell you that I'm not going to kill your folks. That's what you're worried about, isn't it? Well, you don't have to be. I had a perfect opportunity to kill them right there, and I didn't. The fact is, I'm going to leave your family alone. Why? I've been a few people these past few days. I've been Finbar, Shudder, Tesseract. I have to say, though, and I'm not being biased, that I prefer being me. I prefer being Tanith. I'm just prettier, you know, and I smell nicer. But when I was Finbar, I saw that vision of you in the future, and I got so excited. I started thinking of all the different ways we could help. First, we were worshipping you. Then we tried possessing you, and that didn't work. Have you talked to any psychics lately? They're still having dreams about Darkus. Did you know that? Whatever you did, Val, it didn't change anything. You sealed your name, but that just means you decide to kill the world all on your own, with nobody controlling you. It means you kill your own parents, of your own free will. So now you see why I don't want any harm to come to your folks. I want you to get there naturally. I want things to happen as they're meant to happen. And that means your parents stay alive and stay healthy, right up until the moment you kill them. And what are you going to do? Valkyrie asked. You're just going to sit around and watch? I'm not the sitting around type now, am I? I'll be getting into all sorts of trouble, don't you fret? I'll be guiding you, nudging you. Every so often, I'll give you the occasional push, just to keep life interesting, to make sure you're not straying too far from your path. I will never become Darkus. You already did, Val, for three minutes, and it was beautiful. And I understand it now, why she turned on my brothers and sisters. Darkus is indiscriminate about who she kills. She is a true, pure force of destruction. The next time she comes out, I don't plan to be anywhere nearby. I'll die first, Valkyrie said. I'll kill myself. No, said Tanith, you won't. I'd rather die than hurt my family. But you won't kill yourself. You don't have it in you. You don't know what I have in me. But we're all going to find out, Tanith smiled. How is my family, by the way? My other family? The remnants are trapped and locked away. We're finding somewhere new to keep them. You'll never find them. Maybe I will. Maybe I won't. But that's all yet to come, isn't it? We have all that to look forward to. For the right now, though, for the here and now, the most we can do is enjoy the time we have left. She held out her arms. Hug. Valkyrie stayed where she was, and eventually Tanith dropped her arms. You really need to lighten up, you know that? I've lightened up completely, now that I'm sharing this mind. Now all I want to do is have fun. Tanith, Valkyrie said, please. We're your friends. I'm your friend. I love you like a sister. And I love you, Val. I really and honestly do. Back when I was me, alone in here, without the remnant, you were my favourite person in the whole world. I would have died for you. And now that the remnant's here with me, I love you even more. Now... I'd kill for you. Valkyrie couldn't help it. Tears came. I know you don't want to hurt anyone. No, Tanith smiled gently. I really, really do. I want my friend back. I want my sister back. I don't want you to be the enemy. Oh, Val, in a few weeks you're probably going to have a proper sister, a real sister. Then... You won't need me any more, and I'll be okay. I'm good at making friends. Speaking of which, would you like to meet my new boyfriend? 
The wall beside her cracked and crumbled, and Billy Ray Sanguine stepped through. Valkyrie moved back instinctively, but he barely paid her any attention. Tanith turned to him, and they kissed, and Valkyrie's insides went cold. That act, the simple act of a kiss, was more powerful than any violent demonstration. Tanith was gone now. She was lost. Don't look so upset, Sanguine said, and Valkyrie realized he was grinning at her. I'll look after her. Thanks, sweetie, Tanith said, resting her head on his shoulder. Will you be all right to get us out of here? So long as you have some more of that painkiller, honey bunny. Tanith dipped into her pocket, came out with a leaf that Sanguine put into his mouth and chewed. Okay, he said. I'm ready. Valkyrie watched them step back against the wall. Thousands of tiny fractures spread outwards behind them. Sanguine went first, the wall sucking him in. We'll come after you, she said. I know you will, said Tanith. What are friends for? Oh, and Val. Happy New Year. The wall swallowed her, too, and Valkyrie was alone. Chapter 55 The Return Tesseract couldn't understand what all the fuss was about. It really wasn't that cold. Russia was cold. Parts of Siberia were especially cold. Ireland, during the winter, was practically tropical. He was looking forward to going home. He'd spent far too long here had been delayed time and time again, but now his return journey was close. All he needed to do was take care of one last piece of business, and then he could put Ireland behind him. He'd been watching the torment for days, but the old man never allowed himself to be caught outside alone. Syke and Portia were always with him, and occasionally Madame Miss joined them for a stroll through the streets of Roarhaven. Tesseract wasn't keen to take them all on again, so he watched and waited. He knew there was an underground tunnel leading from somewhere in the town to the sanctuary. Twice now the torment had exited the sanctuary without re-entering. Tesseract returned to his trailer, where he examined plans of the town and read back over its history. An underground tunnel was not mentioned in any of his research. He took a different approach, focusing instead on the Torment's known associates. Like many of Roarhaven's citizens, the Torment hadn't been born in the town. He had retreated there, no longer prepared to tolerate the mortal civilization that showed no sign of stopping its global spread. Roarhaven was a town of prejudice and bigotry, of bitter sorcerers and magical malcontents. The Torment, and later on, the other children of the spider, found a home there that welcomed them and their views. Beneath his mask, Tesseract smiled. He found a mention of Vorian Scapegrace in a story from the Torment's past. Scapegrace had once been a citizen here, before he'd been kicked out. He'd even owned a tavern for a few years. Tesseract put the files away and chose a new mask from the wall. This one had rivets over the brow and a long slit at the mouth. The needle sank into the puckered wounds around his face as he left his trailer. He walked for fifteen minutes before he reached the edge of the town. Using the night as cover, he stole through the streets, moving so silently even those he crept behind didn't hear him. The tavern was dark, the door locked. He forced a window at the back and climbed through. He found a trapdoor behind one of the bars and followed the steps down into the living quarters. The lamps were on, but no one was there. Tesseract waited. A little under three hours later, he heard a low rumble coming from the bedroom, the sound of a wall sliding apart. He didn't move. The wall slid shut again, and now he could hear shuffling footsteps moving into the small living room. Music began to play. He knew the group. 
It was The Carpenters, but he wasn't sure of the name of the song. There's a kind of hush, perhaps. The last song the torment would ever hear. Tesseract hoped he liked it. He moved silently to the living room, but when he stepped in, it was empty. I don't wish to alarm you, Skullduggery said from behind him, but I have a gun pointed at your head. Tesseract spun, flailing one arm, and managed to knock Skullduggery's hand to one side just as he fired. He battered at the gun hand again, sent the revolver flying, and Skullduggery caught him with a right hook that almost sent him to the carpet. If you would just give yourself up, Skullduggery said as he kicked him, you'd make this a lot easier on me. Tesseract caught the second kick in the crook of his arm, and immediately Skullduggery sprang into the air, twisting from Tesseract's grip. He tried to push at the air, but Tesseract lunged, barreling into him, forcing him back. Tesseract got an elbow in his ear for his trouble, and he fought a wave of dizziness that threatened to topple him. The skeleton snapped out two punches to the head, then sent a sneaky one to the ribs. Tesseract felt something pop, and he growled. Skullduggery swayed away from one punch and blocked the next, but couldn't stop the third. Tesseract grabbed him and pulled his head down to meet his knee, then hooked two fingers into his left eye socket and stepped back, swinging him around the room. Skullduggery hit the couch and went over. Tesseract picked him up and slammed him head first into the wall. He did it twice more, until he was sure the detective was dazed, and then he dropped him. He heard the rumble of the parting wall and left the living room. The torment emerged from the bedroom, looked up, and his old eyes widened for a moment. I see, he said. There's no point in arguing with you, is there? None, Tesseract admitted. You tried to kill me, and you didn't pay me. I can't have that. I should have cut your throat. You should have. Tesseract pressed his hand against the torment's forehead and splintered his skull. The old man's body dropped, and Tesseract stepped over it. He could hear Skullduggery on his feet again, no doubt with his gun back in his hand. Tesseract hurried into the bedroom and ran through the gap in the wall, into the tunnel beyond. A few moments later, he heard Skullduggery sprinting after him. The tunnel was long and dark. It began to incline, the darkness giving way to an indistinct grey that became a door. Tesseract ran through, into one of the sanctuary's broad corridors. His natural inclination was to stick to the shadows, but the corridors ahead were brighter, and that meant they led to the exit. He ran on. A bullet tugged at his coat at the same time as he heard the shot, and he dodged right, bursting into a room. He ignored the sorcerer inside, and went straight for the opposite door. He found himself in another room, filled with boxes and unopened crates. He grabbed a crowbar and stepped to one side. Skullduggery ran in, and Tesseract swung for his legs. Skullduggery did a flip and crashed down. The crowbar hit him again, and he grunted, and Tesseract helped him to his feet with a kick to the ribs. The crowbar cracked against Skullduggery's cheek, making him reel back. I haven't been paid to kill you, Tesseract said. Lie down and don't get up. You don't have to die tonight. Skullduggery clicked his fingers, and a fireball sparked off in his hand. Tesseract hurled the crowbar. It struck the skeleton between the eye sockets, and he went down. The light in the room flickered, and Tesseract frowned. Shadows moved along the walls, in the corners, across the floor. He looked around, looked for whoever was doing this. The shadows whipped at him like a giant claw, its talons ripping deep into his back. Tesseract spun in almost a full circle, and for a moment he thought he might stay on his feet. But no, his legs collapsed from under him, and he fell. He'd once known a man who said that life hinged on the moment, that everything changed in the blink of an eye. Tesseract knew the truth of that as well as anybody. It was in those moments that he struck, after all, 
snatching people's lives away. He'd always known that it was only a matter of time before one of those moments worked against him. The shadows had torn right through his body. He fancied he could feel his organs shutting down, one by one. The room was quiet. The sorcerer in the other room, the one he'd passed, had obviously fled. Tesseract doubted there were any others working through the night. This sanctuary wasn't fully active after all. It would take a few weeks for that. He watched Skullduggery pick up his gun and stand. It took him a moment to see Tesseract lying there in a pool of his own blood. The detective's head tilted. He was puzzled. Then he looked up at something behind Tesseract. Tesseract heard footsteps but couldn't move his head. All he could do was watch Skullduggery as he backed away. No, Skullduggery said. Skullduggery fired three times. The footsteps didn't even slow down. Now, Tesseract could see someone stepping into the edge of his vision. A shadow flicked the gun from Skullduggery's hand. The detective went to push at the air, but another shadow batted his arm down. Skullduggery charged, and the figure in black watched him come, and then the shadows swooped in. They slid beneath Skullduggery's clothes. Tesseract could see them curl and writhe within him. They were in his very skeleton, wrapping around his bones, and Skullduggery screamed in agony as he was lifted off his feet. Darkness slipped from his open jaws to his eye sockets, leaked from his sleeves to between the buttons of his shirt. His body was rigid while the darkness investigated every part of him, and still he screamed. The figure observed him without moving, letting the shadows do all the work, and then it was over. Skullduggery fell to the ground as the shadows retracted melting back into the black armor their master wore. You can't be here, Skullduggery said. You died. You're dead. The figure must have said something in response, but Tesseract didn't hear. This is insane, Skullduggery said. He put all his strength into getting to his hands and knees. You can't be here. This is... You can't be here. The man in the black armor walked slowly around the detective, who was shaking his head like he was willing this not to be true. You're dead. You're not real. You're dead. The figure stopped walking, and Skullduggery looked up at him like he was listening. Tesseract thought he could hear the faintest of whispers, and then Skullduggery roared in anger and leaped up, his fist struck the figure, and there was an explosion of darkness, a wave of shadows that filled the room, and then it was gone. Tesseract blinked, his vision returning. Skullduggery was on the floor, on his knees with his head down. The figure in black was gone. Tesseract grimaced as he rolled onto his side. Moving slowly, he got to his feet. He could no longer feel the pain in his back. His legs were going numb. He was aware of all the blood he was losing, but he didn't dwell on any of it. Instead, he pointed himself at the door and walked. Each step was a battle. Stop, said Skullduggery from behind him. Tesseract stopped. He didn't turn. He didn't have to. From the angle of the voice... He knew that Skullduggery was standing, and, most likely, the gun was back in his hand. Who was that? Tesseract asked. No one. The gaping wound in my back tells a different story. I recognize the armor. It's the same armor Baron Vengeus wore three years ago, isn't it? But that wasn't Baron Vengeus. You're under arrest. Beneath his mask, Tesseract smiled. I'm dead, detective. I have a few minutes left, if I'm lucky. He killed me most effectively, did he not? I would at least like to know his name. Did he give it? He did. And 
What name did he give? For a moment, Skullduggery didn't answer. Then, he said he was Lord Vile. Tesseract gritted his teeth and turned halfway so he could see the skeleton detective. Skullduggery stood with his gun held down by his side. And where is he now? Did you strike him down with one mighty blow? He's gone. I don't know where he is. I hit him and he vanished. What did he say to you? What does it matter? I'd really like to know. Skullduggery shook his head. Tesseract waited, feeling those precious seconds slip by him. So, so slowly. When Skullduggery spoke again, his voice was surprisingly empty. He said he came back for her. For Valkyrie? He's building his strength. When he's strong enough, he'll kill her. He said he'd kill the Deathbringer. Then all the necromancers. And why did he choose to tell you? What connection do you have to him? Skullduggery didn't answer. He emptied his gun of spent shells. I know about you, Tesseract continued. I made a file on everyone I am likely to go up against. I know about you, and I know there is no recorded instance of you and Lord Vile ever meeting. That's right, Skullduggery said. He slipped a fresh bullet into a chamber. You never fought him, never faced him. When he arrived, you were gone. Why did you choose then to leave, I wonder? Did you know what was coming? You think you know about me, Skullduggery said. But you don't. Another bullet into the chamber. You're scared of him, aren't you, detective? I know fear. I've felt it often enough, and I've inflicted it. You're terrified of him. So much so that you ran when you realized he was coming. Are you going to run this time, I wonder? Skullduggery clicked the chamber back into place. No running. Not any more. I'm going to stand and fight. So... What is your connection? Why do you fear him? What power does he have over you? Skullduggery raised the gun and thumbed back the hammer. Slowly, Tesseract brought his hands up to the straps around his head, his numb fingers clumsily unbuckling the mask. Finally, it came free, and he let it fall, felt the air on his ravaged face. It felt so good. He felt like laughing. A dying man's last request, he said. Answer me this. You were killed, yet you came back. Do you know how it happened? Do you know who would be powerful enough to hold back death, true death? Was it necromancy that brought you back, Skullduggery? Was it Lord Vile? Skullduggery's gloved finger tightened on the trigger. But before the gun fired... Tesseract's legs gave way beneath him once again. He stumbled to the wall, hit it with his shoulder, and slid down to the floor. There was no pain, which was nice, because he could feel the rot spreading over his head. When he looked up, Skullduggery was putting his gun away. Not going to kill me? he asked. Waste of a bullet. I realize I have no right to ask this, but... Would you help me outside? It's almost dawn, and I would like to feel the sun on my face. Skullduggery tilted his head slightly. Then he came forward, stooped to wrap Tesseract's left arm around his neck, and straightened up, lifting Tesseract out of a pool of his own blood. The problem with living so long, Tesseract said, as Skullduggery walked him to the door, is that we get used to it. We watch the mortals age and wither and die around us, watch the world change and decay. But no matter the hardship or the pain or the sorrow we suffer, we choose to continue living. Out of sheer habit, I think. You're quite chatty now that I've got to know you, Skullduggery said. 
I have a cat, you know, back home. I know. You had cat hair on your lapel the day you killed Davina Marr. Uh, you don't miss much, do you? She doesn't have a name. She's just cat. She curls up on my chest whenever I sit down and goes to sleep. I hope she doesn't miss me. I'm going to miss her. They emerged into the cold air of the morning. Dawn had yet to break. Skullduggery found a bench, and he let Tesseract sit, facing the stagnant lake, and beyond it the horizon. Then he sat beside him. Is there anything you regret? Skullduggery asked. I regret being mortally wounded just a few minutes ago. Understandable. Apart from that, no... I lived, I killed, my life is my own. The rot was seeping through Tesseract's body. He turned his hand over, but it was probably a good thing he couldn't see much in this dim light. He felt the flesh bubble like he was being boiled from the inside out. It was an effort to look up again. What about you? he asked, his words not much more than a mumble. Regrets? Manny, Skullduggery said. Tesseract's breath rattled in his chest. That's the good thing about living. You get to make up for past mistakes. Or make brand new ones. Tesseract tried to smile, but didn't have the strength for it. His head dipped, and Skullduggery reached out to steady him, the sun cracked the horizon, split it with light that spilled through the sky in streaks of orange and deep red. That was Skullduggery Pleasant, Mortal Coil. By Derek Landy. Read by Brian Bowles. Produced by ID Audio for Harper Audio. Audible hopes you've enjoyed this program.